the study session of the Aurora City Council uh, for uh, Monday, April 18, 2022 is called to order. Uh, would the clerk please call the roll? Mayor Kaufman? Here. Mayor Pro Tim Bergen? Here. Councilmember Coombs? Present. Councilmember Gardner? Councilmember Drinsky? Here. Councilmember Lawson? Here. Councilmember Marcano? Present. Councilmember Medina? Here. Councilmember Mario? Councilmember Sundberg? Here. And Councilmember Zvonik? Here. There's a quorum. Uh, um, announcement for the public call in line. Thank you for joining. Thank you for joining tonight's Aurora City Council study session. If you are listening on the phone, please note public comments are not taken during study sessions. The phone line is in listen only mode. The City Council welcomes comments from residents at regular council meetings on both matters appearing on the agenda and during public invited to be heard. Sign up on those evenings begins at 6 p.m. Uh, there's no mayor update, no issue updates. Um, is there any objection to moving item number 4A forward on the consent calendar? Uh, mayor, I'm sorry, we have the Planning and Zoning Commission interviews. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> wow. Oh, wow. Uh, Brian Matisse. I'm sorry, the first one is Garrett Aaron. Okay. So, uh, Garrett Ahern. Um, is Garrett on? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, um, Garrett, you have two minutes uh, to give introductory remarks about why you would like to be on the Planning Commission. Um, please proceed. Yeah, so um, I applied for and I'm interested in uh, joining the Planning and Zoning Commission um, because I recently um, became a, well, last year I became a uh, resident of the city of Aurora and um, as a civil engineer, which is my career, um, what I do for a living, um, I think I have something to offer the city in terms of my technical expertise in plan set production and um, simple civil design. Um, and I think that as a civil engineer with that expertise, I'd be able to offer the city um, a unique set of eyes in which to look at um, and exercise the various uh, powers and duties that I would hold as a member of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Thank you. Um, uh, council members will be asking you um, questions and you will have one minute to answer each, each question. Um, first question is from Mayor Pro Tem Bergen. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you, Garrett, for applying for uh, this very important commission. Um, so if you were a planning commission and you were at a hearing where a site plan for a contentious multifamily development was being proposed, uh, you heard the developer state that they meet all of the city zoning requirements, and yet you have 30 neighbors that are testifying against it, saying that it's going to reduce their property values, it's going to create too much traffic, and it's also going to eliminate the vacant parcel that should be open space. How would you decide to um, approve or to disapprove the project? Yeah, that's a great question. I would, uh, first I would take the time to fall back on the um, foundational documents which guide my role as a member of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, I believe those to be four documents, um, including the UDOs, the city charter, city code, and, and the Aurora Places uh, comprehensive plan. Um, and I think across those four documents, um, there there are certain um, criteria that are pretty black and white, um, and then there's others that uh, lean towards discretion um, being exercised in certain instances. Um, I think I would have to listen to arguments from all parties 
all stakeholders involved and using that information in combination with the documents that I outlined before, I think um, I would have all the tools I need uh, in addition to any council from city council um, to make that to make decisions on a, on on an issue like that. Outlined. So would you approve or disapprove based on kind of I know you don't have all the information, but if on that scenario. Um, in that scenario, uh, if all criteria were being met by the developer and the development was one that had um, fulfilled all the processes outlined in table 5.2-1, um, I think I would have to uh, move forward and approve. Um, that would be my, my duty under the commission. Okay, thank you very much. Councilmember Coombs. Yes, um, so my question is related to redevelopment. Um, we have a lot of areas in our city that are um, shopping centers that have a lot of vacancies um, and are struggling to attract and retain tenants. Um, so how would you approach redevelopment in those areas of the city? Yeah, another great question. I think there's a certain amount of elasticity um, in some of those documents, the four documents that I, uh, the four uh, pieces of, of documentation, I guess, that I outlined before. Um, and I think uh, amongst one of those, particularly the comprehensive plan, um, as a planning and zoning commission, we should be able to adapt to the changing needs of the city and address those in a novel way um, that both recognizes the current environment um which a lot of these shopping centers from just my personal experience are were built in the 80s 70s 80s some in the early 90s and um both the economic uh situation uh in the city and the socioeconomic demographics of the city have changed a lot in that time so i think um there's a lot that would have to be taken into account to adapt to those changing needs Uh, Councilmember Gardner, is Councilmember Gardner with us? Councilmember Jarinski? Thank you for replying. I do not have a question. Councilmember Lawson? Thank you, Garrett, for replying. Um, my question to you is, what is um, the biggest planning issue or problem you see with the city today? Uh, yeah. Uh, Another great question. I think that there's a lot um, going on in the city in terms of redevelopment, which we just touched on. And um, also, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Bergen touched on the fact that sometimes residents aren't stoked or on board with um, the direction in which development may be going within their local neighborhood. Um, and so I think that as we continue to grow and develop into the land that we've annexed to the east, um, I think taking learning from past experiences and taking those uh, lessons into account um, is going to be crucial in developing in a way that meets the needs of the future, um, as well as the, the current needs that um, the the city faces. Um, so whether that be uh, housing, whether that be business development, um, commerce and uh, industry attracting industry attracting businesses uh, continue to grow the economy of Aurora all those things should be taken into account when making um, all those things I think are, are pressing issues um, that we face today mayor uh, mayor can I just add a part B this will be for all of the candidates yes, please. Go for it, please. so you um, you talked about the southeast corridor but what about the inner core of the city the older part of the city do you still have the same uh, thought process with that as well, or do you think it's a little should, it's a little different perspective? I, I actually I'm I would say I'm more excited about the existing uh, landscapes, developed landscapes of Aurora. I think there's so much potential to realize the you know the future of Aurora um, in those places. Um, and I think business is going to play a huge role in that um, in attracting um, the individuals that are going to make up these communities. Um, so I think there's a lot, a lot to be done and a lot of potential in those areas as well. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Marcano. 
Thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you, Garrett, for joining us. And uh, also thank you, Mayor Pretem Bergen, because I think you asked almost the exact same question as I wanted to ask. So I'll ask you this one instead, Garrett, uh, and that is, if appointed, uh, do you see an opportunity in your role to work with council to ensure our code is serving our residents as best as possible? And if so, could you provide us with an example of such an opportunity? Yeah, certainly. I think... Um... I think there's always opportunities um, as presented by council essentially for uh, me to play a role with council in uh, seeing where the code can be brought up to date and where potentially it can be, um, I wouldn't say streamlined, but um, reprioritized uh, to the needs of the city and making sure that development can take place in an expeditious manner but also in a in a thoughtful a well thought through um and a a mindful manner i guess i would say um meeting the needs of the city um so having the, that dialogue with uh, council i think um would be a cornerstone of um updating certain elements of the code all right thank you councilor medina Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Gary, for applying. My question is, uh, what are your thoughts around the city uh, planning for more walkability in communities and density issues? Yeah, I think that's a that's a uh, tricky, um, it's a challenging um, thing that, you know, we're going to have to address in the coming years and decades. Um, and it ultimately falls on where in the city you find yourself, I think. Certain areas of Aurora lend themselves towards more dense development, and um, the community has already grown in a way that um, makes denser development that leans towards walkability more appropriate. Um, at the same time, I think we have um, an abundance of land uh, that's yet to be developed, and I just see the current trend of um, single family housing developments. Um, continuing um at least into the foreseeable future um as the model of uh of individual families um housing i guess and i think that there's certain aspects of those communities that walkability can be incorporated as a as a key feature of those communities at the same time i think there's the need of of uh, farther Trans transportation needs a uh, greater um, distance being covered, I guess. And so there's other options there um, other than walkability and not only via vehicles um, as predominantly today, but um, other forms as well. Thank you. Uh, uh, Councilmember Murillo. Councilmember Sunberg. Hey, Garrett. Have you ever contemplated and maybe considering more Eastern Aurora where there's more land to be developed, have you contemplated what changes might be made to the code to meet demand for housing that's more attainable, maybe with respect to modular homes, smaller lots, et cetera? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I think um, we would have to address the existing landscape as as it is and the infrastructure that exists today to um, find appropriate places where we can build a more um, equitable housing environment, I guess you would say, um, where uh, we can meet the full spectrum of uh, economic uh, circumstances and also realize um, the American dream of, of home ownership. Um, so I think creative solutions like um, tiny homes or um, other, you know, sort of forward looking uh, forms of, of development, um, if done in the right way, if done, you know, thoughtfully and purposefully um, can really lend themselves to building the community as a whole, um, especially in Eastern Aurora. Uh, Councilmember Zavonik. 
Um, uh, Garrett, hey, thanks for applying. I don't have any questions. Uh, both Mayor Pro Tem and Councilmember Marcano asked the two questions I had, but I, I really do appreciate how much research and time you put into really understanding this position. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I appreciate that. But Mr. Ahern, you have one minute for um, uh, wrap up concluding remarks. Yeah, uh, so um, as may be apparent now that you've gotten to uh, speak with me a little bit more, um, there's still a lot for me to learn, but um, I have an open mind and I'm eager to learn. Um, at the same time, I think I bring a lot um, with, with me, uh, with my current experience as a civil engineer and uh, being able to look at um, a variety of different activities that may be uh, brought to the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, and when I say activities, different areas that fall under uh, Table 5.2-1. Um, and I think I'll, I'll be able to bring a critical eye to, uh, to serving the needs of the people of Aurora, the citizens of Aurora, um, as well as uh, fulfilling my duties as outlined in um, the city code, the city charter, uh, the UDOs, and um, the comprehensive plan. So I look forward to the opportunity to serve um, on the Planning and Zoning Commission, and thank you all for your time uh, this afternoon. Thank you. Katie, are we prepared to go with the next individual? Yes, I spoke with Joshua, and he said that he's um, connecting right now. Okay.
Okay, Mayor Joshua Deaker is on the call. Uh, Joshua Deaker, thank you. Thank you so much for applying. You have uh, two minutes for opening remarks and tell us why you would like to be on the Planning Commission and, and your qualifications. I don't know if you can hear me. It does not appear that I have sound, so I am trying to figure that out right now. Yeah, you're fine. We can hear you. Maybe he can't hear us. Yeah. Can you hear, can you hear us, Mr. Deco? Apparently not. Katie, do we have a phone number for him that Adrian could give him a call? Yes, Adrian, I just spoke. He's going to reach out to him and assist him with his. Thanks. Is he able to look at the, well, I don't know if he can read the chat, but the audio visual um, tab above, I don't know if we could put it in chat for him. Yeah, I think Adrian is, is um, has connected with him and is helping him right now. I just spoke to Josh. Hi, this is Adrian. I just spoke to Josh and he's going to just call in on the audio line there rather than keep you guys waiting. And um, I'll unmute him when he's on there. So his audio will come through the phone. All right. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, well, Mr. Decker, we can hear you. Oh, thank goodness. I'm so sorry for that, guys. Well, uh, we'll proceed now. Uh, you have two minutes uh, for opening remarks as to uh, why you would like to serve on the Planning Commission and your qualifications to do so. Please proceed. Thank you. Um, for, just to introduce myself, I'm Joshua Deaker. Uh, I've lived in Aurora for about two years. 
Uh, I'm a lawyer by training, though I don't practice the law. Uh, I currently work for a home building company called Taylor Morrison. Um, prior to moving to the Denver area, the bulk of my career has been spent in um, public advocacy and the nonprofit sector. Um, but I've also worked in the offices of elected officials at both the statewide and the federal level. Um, and I've worked with uh, municipal campaigns and municipal governments as well. Um, my career has moved more toward the private sector, uh, but my passion still lies in uh, community building and, and improving communities. So when I saw there was a vacancy on the Planning and Zoning Commission, uh, it seemed like a good way to kind of blend my public service experience uh, as well as my career in the real estate development industry um, and kind of let me use the expertise from both of those things uh, in a way that serves the community. Um, I also, you know, I know that Planning and Zoning is a quasi-judicial uh, commission, and so I do think my law school background uh, would bring a valuable set of skills as well. Um, so ultimately, I just think between, uh, you know, having the, the, the legal degree, the experience in um, sort of public service community-related work, as well as the experience in uh, uh, real estate development, I, I just feel like I would be a good fit for the commission and would be very interested in, in becoming a part of it. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Bergen for the first question. Oh, you will have one answer, uh, one minute, I'm sorry, to answer questions uh, given to you by uh, members of the City Council. Mayor Pro Tem Bergen for the first question. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Joshua, for applying for this important commission. Um, I'm, I'm, mine is a scenario-based question. So as a planning okay. commission, you're at a hearing where a site plan for a very contentious multifamily development is being proposed. Uh, proposed. The developer um, states that they meet all of the city's zoning rules um, and codes. The neighbors oppose it, and there's 30 neighbors testifying um, that it will reduce their property values, it will create too much traffic, and eliminate uh, a vacant parcel that should be left as open space. How would you decide to approve or disapprove this project? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think the, the, the first thing planning and zoning has to look at is just what are the city rules and regulations and does it meet them? I think um, sort of on its face, planning and zoning's role is to make a recommendation to the council based on does this meet our city guidelines or does it not? Um, and so if it does, I think it's generally planning and zoning's role to recommend that city council do approve. Um, that said, obviously, uh, community uh, input is extremely important, um, but I think if we are kind of superseding what the rules and regs say and making an exception, that's more of a, a council role than a zoning commission role, if, I under if my understanding is correct. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Council Member Coons, the next question. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Joshua, for being with us. Um, my question is about redevelopment. Um, we have a lot of aging shopping centers within the city of Aurora that have low occupancy and difficulty attracting and retaining tenants. So how would you approach redevelopment of those centers? Um, again, and, and I may start to sound like a broken record, my, I, I would probably first lean on, you know, what, what what policies and regulations are are in place um, for the you know zoning commission to, to look at when weighing that? Um, I absolutely agree that there is a, a lot of um, unused infrastructure, and I I do think we should do whatever we can um, to encourage um, using uh, existing construction before you know, moving out into new space and, and doing new construction. So, um, you know, I, I do think it, it's it's wise to, to um, you know, do whatever we can to, to see that those spaces get utilized. Thank you. Um, Council Member Gardner? Council Member Jarinski? Thank you so much for applying, Joshua. I do not have a question for you. Council Member Lawson. Thank you, Joshua, for applying. Um, what is the biggest planning issue or problem you see with the city today? Biggest problem or issue? Um, planning issue. 
I know that there is a great deal of concern about sprawl, um, and and we see it, you know. And I, I I work in the home building industry, so I'm I'm extremely familiar with um, you know home builders um, buying up huge swaths of land and and developing more and more single family. So I do think um, th- I do think there's a lot of room to. Uh, improve on on uh, how we use our space um, and uh, increase density where we are able. Um, I also know as as uh, residential areas continue to sprawl and spread outward, um, a lot of those areas are are getting further and further away from um, important services like grocery stores and and gas stations and access to city services. Um, so I think all of those things are kind of interrelated and, and being able to uh, improve our density as well as improving access uh, for, for residents throughout the community to be able to get to important services um, are probably the, the biggest things facing uh, planning and zoning at this time. And Mayor, can I just go with my part? Please, please proceed. Well, um, thank you so much for that. So that's kind of focused on our southeast area. What about our more um, aging inner core of the city? Um, do you still have the same philosophy about that, or do you think you have differences of opinion on how we should um, the planning issue or problems with that part of the city mm-hmm. as well? Well, I, I do think uh, you know in the in the older parts of the city and kind of the core. Um, the density question is less of an issue. There, it is more dense there. Um, so, in in those parts of the city, I think the important thing is probably, and this kind of goes back to a, a previous question: um, finding spaces that are um, not currently utilized, and uh, figuring out the best way to utilize those to improve access to, you know, city services and necessities that are in those more densely packed area. Um, you know, it, wherever that access may be lacking. Okay, thank you. Councilmember McConnell. All right, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Joshua, for joining us and for your interest in serving the city in this capacity. So my question for you is, if you are appointed, do you see opportunity in your role to work with council to ensure that our code is serving our residents uh, as much as possible? And if so, could you provide us with an example of such an opportunity? I would absolutely look forward to opportunities to, um, you know, review and and understand the code well and see places uh, where it can work better. Um, I have I have not closely studied code, so I can't offer maybe a specific example at this time that, you know, I've already seen and thought, you know, we can do better there. Um, But doing that kind of uh, research and kind of thinking about what we can do better is absolutely uh, would be an interest of mine. Um, And I think, uh, you know, even in the absence of a a specific code that I am currently aware of and know we can improve, um, I think sort of my general philosophy would absolutely be, um, and like I've mentioned several times, making sure that we have good access to um, services and necessities for residents in every part of the community. And so anywhere where we could make code improvements that would ease that access, I would be in favor of. All right, thank you, Joshua. Mm-hmm. Council Member Medina. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Joshua. Uh, my question is, what are your thoughts around the way the city can plan better for walkability and density issues? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I have mentioned density uh, and you know access several times. I think walkability, bikeability, fits really well into that. Um, I think that is easier to do in the um, you know the the older parts of the community, the the core, um, because a lot of that infrastructure already exists. So it's just a matter of making sure that we're utilizing spaces um, that are available. Um, making sure that, uh, you know, sidewalks and protected bike lanes or or however we want to make transportation easier, you know, making sure those are there uh, is definitely much easier in that part of the town, in the city. Um, in the kind of more sprawled out suburban areas, obviously it's a, it's a bigger challenge. 
Um, but I do think things like trying to make sure there's grocery and gas and access to transit um, close to neighborhoods as we sprawl further and further out um, is, is key to making sure that those communities are livable and accessible. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Morio. Council Member Sundberg. Hello, Joshua. Uh, based on your home building experience and uh, your efforts there to build, uh, anything in the planning department recently you'd like to see changed as a result of obstacles or holdups? Mm -hmm. um, um, my experience uh, tends to be more on the uh, construction side. So I haven't in my professional capacity really interacted with the city in, in that way very much. Um, so I don't have a ton of experience on, on that particular aspect of it. Um, that said, uh, at least on the construction side, having worked with Denver, Commerce City, Aurora, um, Castle Rock, um, I think Aurora does have a, a reputation as being fairly easy to work with for builders in comparison to um, some of the other communities. Um, and I think that is to our credit. I think that, uh, you know, allows us to really kind of um, harness and, and build on the growth that we're seeing throughout the Denver Metro um, here in Aurora. Council members of Yeah, Yeah, uh, Joshua, you'd mentioned a couple of times that your desire to have, when you look at developments, to have enough retail or adequate retail and shopping close to developments. What role, if any, do you believe that planning and zoning has to ensure that that actually is the case with uh, new development? Mm -hmm. Um, I, again, I, I, I'm, I'm aware that, uh, primarily planning and zoning's role is to review applications for development and compare them to the existing, you know, guidelines and, and regulations that the city council has put in place. So, um, I know that planning and zoning doesn't necessarily have the authority to say, this area absolutely needs a grocery store, so let's plunk one down right here in the middle of this community. Um, that said, I, I know that the commission also does work in an advisory role. Um, and so I do think, uh, you know, as we as we see bigger and bigger residential um, communities kind of growing outward, um, I definitely see a role for planning and zoning in advising the, the council on uh, maybe needing to increase retail um, space uh, with relation to, to where uh, residential development is moving. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Deeker. You have uh, one minute for closing remarks. Okay. Um, uh, really, I just, I wanna thank all of you for um, inviting me to, to interview with you today. I know you had quite a few candidates to look at and I'm sure you have quite a few to hear from today, um, but, uh, Kind of as I mentioned when I started out, I I do think uh, my my legal background, my real estate background, as well as my advocacy background, kind of all fit together really well in this kind of a role. Um, so I I look forward to working with you in the future, and and I I hope very much that I can um, you know serve this community uh, from the Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, thank you, Joshua. Um... I really appreciate your applying for this job and your interest uh, in serving your community. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Katie, uh, we have uh, Brian Matisse. Is he up or do we need to take a break? No, he is logging in right now. Okay.
Okay, Mayor, it looks like uh, Brian is on the line. Oh, Brian? Brian, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay. Does he have his camera on? Okay, there he is. Mm. Yes, he does. You sh should be able to see me. Uh, no, I can't. I can see you, Brian. I can see you. Mm. I can now. I can't. Are you on grid B, Mayor? Um, there we go. Um, am I on what? I'm sorry. On grid view, top right hand corner of uh, the visual air part of WebEx, there's a little layout button. Mm -hmm. grid. But when he speaks, he should actually come front, right? Yeah, if I speak, yes, now we see you. <laughs> okay, there we go. Uh, Brian Matisse, uh, thank you so much for your interest in serving the city. Uh, you have two minutes to tell us a little bit about yourself and why you'd like to be on the Planning Commission. Yeah, good afternoon, Mayor Kaufman and, and City Council members. I'm Brian Matisse. Um, I've been a resident of Aurora since uh, January of 2003, originally living in a condominium complex near Havana in Mississippi. And then since July of 2005 in Toge Crossing, in uh, Southeast Aurora. Um, I'm the first person in my, my family to graduate college, and my professional background includes being a physicist, a high school teacher, and uh, since uh, 2002, an attorney uh, in, in Colorado. Um, I formerly served for four years on the Citizens Advisory Budget Committee, and I've been a board member of the Toge Crossing Metropolitan District in, uh, in Aurora since uh, 2006, so for the past 16 years. I'm interested in serving on the Planning uh, Commission because I believe that well thought out long range plan development is better in the long run than ad hoc development. I think it results in a better transportation flow. It results in nearby jobs, especially for low income residents that can't commute across the city. Uh, it results in less crime, and I think it results in more commercial activity, which, as you know, improves sales tax revenues, which is critical to uh, to the city budget. You know, plus the citizens, I think, are happy if they have close access to things. Uh, the commission's quasi-legislative functions of recommending changes to the comprehensive plan, or places, and to the uniform, um, uh, I'm sorry, unified uh, development ordinance are important, and I believe that, that I can make important, uh, well-thought-out contributions to those. Uh, similarly, I believe that the balanced perspective I bring to both the, the perspective of residents and the perspective of property owners and developers um, to, is, is sufficient to make, uh, to, to make well-thought-out and fair quasi-judicial recommendations to City Council on matters such as individual property owners' entitlements, like zoning changes, um, requests for, for variances. Uh, I know we have differences, and regardless of those differences, I believe we share common goals. I think those common goals include a city that works for its residents and taxpayers, um, a city that does so fairly and justly, um, and, and is fiscally responsible. You know, for the last 16 years, my vision. Brian, you've reached your two minutes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, for the first question, uh, Mayor for Tim Bergen. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and um, thank you, Brian. Good to see you. Um, he's see actually you. a constituent of mine. <laughs> um, so um, my question is a scenario-based question. Um, as a planning uh, commissioner, you're at a hearing where a site plan for a contentious multifamily development is being proposed. The developer um, states that they meet all of the city zoning rules and code. The neighbors oppose it. In fact, there are 30 neighbors testifying. 
um, that it will reduce their property values, create too much traffic, and eliminate the vacant parcel that should be left as open space. How would you decide to approve or disapprove the project? Sure. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, first of all, you have to determine whether or not there is a vested entitlement. If there's a vested entitlement, which under state law means that there has to be a site-specific development plan approved, like a master plan, then of course, if, if they, the, the developers have, have rights, and they have rights to develop it consistent with that. And therefore, if it's consistent with that, and there's no variances or other, other changes required, typically it would be appropriate to approve it. If they do not have a, a vested entitlement, but it does tend to meet the comprehensive plan regarding Aurora Places, so then I think there's more flexibility there. There's a question as to uh, whether the, the policy goals that council has put into the comprehensive plan like, like Aurora Places is satisfied or not. And at that point, the, the citizen's input, I think is important because if they are demonstrating that their, um, that their, uh, that their input meets uh, or, or prevents, prevents certain uh, policy goals from being achieved, then it may be appropriate to deny that. Once again, you have to look to the overall goals that city council approves. Uh, you know, it's not my job, but you're, you're the policymakers as implemented in, in, in comprehensive plans. And then of course, finally, the uniform development ordinance describes the procedures and the, the requirements we have to look to. Thank you very much. Council Member Coombs. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Brian, for joining us this evening. Um, my question is about redevelopment. We have a lot of shopping centers around the city of Aurora that are underutilized um, and that have trouble attracting and retaining tenants. How would you approach redevelopment in those areas? That, that's very difficult because um, right now, now there's this tendency to look to short-term goals, which is like, let's right away, because of the pandemic, we've had this temporary um, closure of a lot of businesses. There's this tendency to turn everything into residential because that's the, the short-term objective. I think though that, that what I would be focused on if, if a redevelopment project called for a different use of the property than was contemplated under the site plan, then I think um, I would be very much concerned with the fact that we may be looking to something short term that simply um, turns Aurora into a, you know, a, 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 a bedroom, more of a bedroom community and doesn't benefit in the long run because we're taking out commercial properties that, that we're gonna need to revitalize those neighborhoods. And, uh, and that I think is really important. I know that in Tollgate Crossing, we did have a redevelopment project. Uh, it didn't involve commercial, but it did involve uh, multifamily versus a single family, and, and and as well as Habitat for Humanity projects, and you got all the stakeholders involved, and the Metro District took command, and we redeveloped it in a manner that included um, affordable, low-income um, townhomes, for example, that originally the developer wanted to get rid of, and it turned out that, sure enough, the market shifted in a few years, and, and those townhomes now have done very well. The Habitat for Humanity properties have done very well as well. So you got to look to if it. That's why we have comprehensive plans. It's got to fit in the comprehensive plan rather than being just a short-term fix. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilmember Gardner. Councilmember Jurinski. Hi, Brian. Good to see you, and thank you for applying. I do not have a question for you. Councilmember Lawson. Hi, Brian. Thank you for applying. Um, my question to you is: What is the biggest planning issue or problem you see with the city today? The biggest problem I see with the city today is uh, that our Aurora Places comprehensive plan um, is, is a little bit too vague. And as a result of that, um, it tends to lead to approval of almost everything without a clear long-term definition. And that results in an imbalance of housing where we wind up with too much upper middle-class housing in almost every single neighborhood. Um, you know, Aurora Places recognizes that, but it doesn't do anything to build upon that. And it results in poor, poor transportation systems and structures and lack of, uh, lack of transit-oriented development as well. So the problem I see is I would like to see some changes to the comprehensive plan um, that would put a little teeth into the, um, um, the requirement that we try to balance out 
uh, the housing in different categories, both the, um, the affordable housing as well as the longer term housing, uh, the, the higher income housing, um, that we try to say no sometimes to more of the same quick buck upper middle class development just because developers can make a lot of money today and that we make sure there's enough uh, commercial and um, it, it, in particular, um, a transit oriented development, uh, for example, in the in the areas along uh, E-470 and I-70, that's going to provide local businesses the opportunity to grow. Okay, thank you. And just um, part B to that question. So looking at, you kind of focused on most of like a lot of our growth on the Southeast side, but what about our our older neighbor, our older core area of the city, do you still have the same philosophy in terms of or idea that it should be kind of considered the same looking at the comprehensive comprehensive plan and you know how to adapt to that as well, the older part of the sure. city's core? Sure. The, oh, the nice thing about the older part of the city's core is that it does tend to have some protections in there in terms of some of the place types. The problem though is there's still this tendency for urban infill that tends to be more of the same. Um, you know, for example, we're, we're going to be eliminating small businesses. We're going to be eliminating um, low income um, uh, um, trailer parks, whatever, for the purpose of putting in uh, more of what is what is currently profitable. And, and once again, I think once again, Aurora Places needs to be modified to clarify uh, the emphasis on protecting local businesses, the emphasis on protecting the same balance or you know, to fulfill unmet needs. Such thank as you. local housing. Thank you, Brian. Councilmember Mercado. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Brian, for joining us and for your interest in serving our city in this capacity. Uh, my question for you is our city is growing. And with that come, I'm sorry, uh, wrong question. If you're appointed, uh, do you see opportunity in your role to work with council to ensure our code is serving our residents as well as possible? And if so, could you provide us with an example of such an opportunity? Yeah, it, absolutely. One of the uh, um, requirements in the, or I should say one of the duties of the uh, planning commission in the, in the UDO specifically is that uh, the planning commission is to recommend to city council policy changes, policy changes in the UDO, policy changes in uh, um, uh, capital improvements such as transportation and that. Um, I think that the planning commission needs to be proactive in um, holding citizen hearings and maybe updating both the UDO and the um, you know, and, and the Aurora, Aurora spaces, or I should say the, uh, the comprehensive plan. Uh, it, the, one of the big examples is what's going on, for example, in uh, certain corridors that are um, have an opportunity for a lot of uh, development. You know, you've got some examples in the um, um, in the I I two twenty five Beltway, where we do have certain areas like the Simmons that are true urban places, where there's an opportunity for smaller local businesses to support. The, um, the massive infrastructure that's going in with what the medical complex and that. I think, I think that's real important that we include, given the transit-oriented nature of that, some type of improvements there that, um, that promote affordable housing as well as small businesses. I think that's real important. Little coffee shops, for example. We don't, we don't need more Starbucks. We got a lot of them around town. Uh, but, but some of the, 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 the wonderful little coffee shops I think down there are great. Another example is in the, in, we have a huge opportunity in, in E470, I-70 area right there. That's intended to be an urban place. But we don't yet have the mass transit we need. We need to develop a, a transit system that works. And I, I think that needs to be suggested. Another example is uh, uh, in Togate Crossing, where I live, um, we had an opportunity to, um, the, the former developers, before I even got on the board, um, they had dedicated some land that was in a, in a location uh, for potential Habitat for Humanity housing. And we worked with um, Habitat for Humanity. We worked with, um, with council and we wound up getting, uh, get, getting that property developed. And it was wonderful because now you have people that were originally not stakeholders. Um, they were able to get these, these homes, and, and today, the, you know, the first Habitat for Humanity home on our subdivision sold for 
$500,000, which makes these people middle class now. I, I think working on ideas where there are specific changes, and, and that's changes that you guys need to initiate, but we can recommend. Brian, you've reached your two minutes. Brian, you've reached your two minutes. Okay, thank you. To encourage that. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> Councilmember Medina. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, my question is, what are your thoughts around ways the city can plan better for walkability and density issues? Yeah, w walkability is a problem because, um, I mean, obviously in certain neighborhoods, um, the, the, the old Aurora, it's not, it's not as bad as, as others. Uh, the area I lived in, uh, originally before I moved out to the Trogate Crossing, was a, a very nice, nice and walkable area near Havana, near, um, near, near that area, and there were a lot of areas close by. Uh, I think the problem is that we don't have a really good transportation plan yet. And the, the walkability requires a transportation plan where we're matching commercial, uh, especially supermarkets. Uh, we don't want to have urban uh, deserts where there's, there's, there's no food marts close by, for example. I know one of the, the people in Murphy Creek, for example, have been complaining for some time that in that area out there, there's nothing. You know, you've got to you've got to drive ten miles, you know, to get to a supermarket out there. And a lot of it is because um, we haven't stuck to um, the idea of trying to balance out um, commercial and residential. I know that uh, you know that there used to be a lot of proposed commercial in that area, and the developers slowly but surely are convincing people to um, to get away from that. I'll give another example. Of walking. It's not very walkable. It's totally crossing. There was plans for just across I I I uh, uh, E four seventy. There was plans for a town center in Copperfield. There was going to be connectivity between Bellevue and that town center. Well, guess what? The, now, I know this is not a rule, but the town commission decided, oh, there's there's nothing going in there, so the town center we're going to change that to more residential, and we're never going to build the I, I, uh, the overpass on Bellevue that was promised, you know, twenty some years ago. So once again, sticking to master plans. Transportation plans have to have to follow these master plans. Otherwise, uh, otherwise we're just building the same old, same old, and uh, and having unwalkable neighborhoods like we have out here on the in our area. Uh, uh, Councilmember uh, Council Murillo, Councilmember Sunberg. Hello, Brian. Thank you for applying, sir. Hello. Good to see you. Good had to hear you. Uh, mentioned uh, in sort of a critical way development happening in a short-term basis rather than comprehensive long-term fashion planning. Can you be honest in describing any development you regret seeing approved or built in the city of Aurora? Um, yes, I think there's, there's, there are, there are some developments that I have seen um, that I, that I, I think were premature. Let me put it that way, prematurely developed. I think that um, uh, I think the approval of um, well, I'll give you one one of the examples. The, the approval of additional residential that's going up now, and and, and this is going to be in Ward Two. Uh, the approval of so much additional residential that's going up in the um, uh, in the in Ward Two in the um, the Aurora Highlands area before there is sufficient commercial is a, is a huge mistake. I think there was a change about, I want to say about a year or a year and a half ago, where there was some proposed commercial that was, the, the plan was, the commercial was going to go um, in, in one particular area. And uh, the decision was made to swap that to a different area. And of course the commercial wasn't built, instead more residential was being built. So I think, I think a lot of what is going in, I remember another problem is, is that uh, mayor, the former mayor, um, Mayor Hogan, um, he addressed CABC one year, and he said, you know, our plan is, is that we're not going to be putting more residential, you know, a lot more residential in north of, of, uh, of I-70. We don't improve anything in many years, we don't plan to. And I think shortly after he passed away, a whole, a whole raft of new developments were either approved or modified that proposed for just a lot more residential going in up there. Um, the other thing I'm concerned about is I'm concerned about a lot of the uh, a lot of the area around Quincy that went in before 
Quincy was, was enlarged. Now, the original plan was for Quincy to get enlarged, and it, it still hasn't been completely enlarged. So we have this disaster of, of, of a, a crush of homes, a crush of traffic going out to the reservoir on, on uh, summer weekends, because once again, all this development's been approved out there, and all these homes have been approved, and, and people are driving back and forth over Quincy, but yet there's no infrastructure there. Okay, Council Member Zulamik. Hey, Brian, thanks for applying. Appreciate your interest in this. I actually don't have any questions at this time. Both uh, Council Members Bergen and Marcano stole my questions. So what happened to the end of the line. Um, um, let's see, uh, Mr. Matisse, you have uh, one minute for closing remarks. Oh, thank you. Um, councilors and, and, uh, and Mayor, I believe that um, if you look to cities that have plans that work, such as my, my favorite example is Greenwood Village. They have a wonderful master plan that works. Um, they, they have modified their master plan over time, but it still works for them. I, I, I'm sorry, I said called master plan, comprehensive plan. I think the city of Aurora can be just as efficient, can have transportation just as solid. But, but once again, there has to be a, a, a working relationship between council setting the policies and planning and zoning, recommending, and then later interpreting those in our quasi-judicial decisions to approve or deny uh, that will make this city better, more efficient, and, uh, and more convenient for its residents. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Matisse. I deeply appreciate your desire to, uh, again, serve uh, our community. Thank you. Uh, Katie, is uh, uh, Mr. Elkins ready? Yes, he said he's logging on right now. Okay. Okay, Mayor, he is on the call. Okay, um, Mr. Elkins, uh, Stephen Elkins, I want to thank you so much for applying uh, to be um, on uh, the Planning Commission, Planning and Zoning Commission, and um, he's not up on my screen yet. And I can hear you, Mayor Kaufman. Okay, very well. Can everybody else see him? Yes. Stephen Elkins? Okay. There. Okay. Mm. Uh, Stephen, you have uh, two minutes to tell us uh, about yourself and why you would like to be on the Planning and Zoning Commission. Please sure. proceed. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I really appreciate um, your service to our city and for being able to have this opportunity to interview. Um, you know, I'm a trained city planner, as you probably saw from my past interview and my application. And, you know, one thing I just want to say is, city planner, my, my perspective and my, the way I do my job informs my, my job. My job doesn't necessarily inform you know, everything I think and do, um, I ask a lot of questions and a critical thinker. I'm that person asking, do we really need that regulation? Is this really going to get us to the community outcomes that we want? You know, for me, I, I really see this as an opportunity to take the skills that I learned uh, in graduate school and in eight years as being a development review planner and applying them to our city. You know, I'm really excited by the opportunity to apply our plans, to look into our code, to work with our residents, our, our developers, this council, to really get to the great Aurora that we all want so badly. Um, and so I really think, you know, it's it's really a balancing act. I think planning is, is a gray area, um, but it's informed by our long range plans, it's informed by our code, and it's infor informed by council adopted policy. Thank you very much. So the first question, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Bergen. 
Thank you, Mayor, uh, and thank you, Steve, for um, applying again. Um, Mayor, um, I'm wondering, I think I asked the same question to him last time. Uh, would it be okay if I just ask a different question? Yes, please proceed. Okay. Um, yes. Um, could you tell, since your last interview with us, can you tell us if you have um, done any research specifically on planning and, and uh the Planning Commission um, recent approvals and if and your thoughts on that. Sure, and I think this is going to take an answer away from potentially other questions, but I'll, I'll go right into it. You know, I think the East Bank shopping was a really great example of, you know, this council taking a step back on its first he hearing on appeal to this council to really hone in and look at the issues that the community raised and how they align with, with the council and our adopted plans vision for the area. Um, you know, what I heard from that project was there was a greater desire to see small businesses that could potentially be displaced retained in the shopping center. There was a greater desire to see, you know, the process involves some more listening, some more outreach and, and really just how do we better fit redevelopment within the context of that shopping center? And so I think I, one, one thing if I was chosen for this job would be, I'd really be interested to see how do we integrate those ideas, those policies, those changes into the process to make it more predictable and timely since in development, um, time is money. And really we need to be working on predictable, timely processes for our city. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Coombs. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Steve, for joining us again. Um, I'm also going to go ahead and ask a different question since mine was the same as the last round. Um, so, how would you, on the Planning and Zoning Commission, ensure that our city's development is happening in a way that provides equity? and access to transportation, to good quality housing, to green spaces, and to other desirable community elements for our residents. Yeah, thank you so much for the question, Councilmember Coombs. You know, I think I hear a lot about equity. There really is not a day that goes by that I don't hear about equity in my job with my colleagues from the Denver community. But one thing I can say about equity is we really need to look at how do we implement equity I think it's it's one thing to have a conversation about it. It's quite another to implement it. And for me, equity, um, so much of my work is from direct regulatory implementation in development review. And I really think equity has to be built into process. Um, how is our process equitable? For whom is it equitable? How is it equitable? And when is it equitable? I think often when I've seen opposition come to development projects, it's often because certain people have more access and more information and more education than other people. They have the time. So I think we really need to hone in on what does an equitable process for Aurora look like and how do we ensure that everyone has equal access to the process and the education it needs to participate in it. Thank you. Right, Councilmember Gardner. Councilmember Jarinski. And thank you so much for applying again. I do not have a question. Councilmember Lawson. Hi, Stephen. Thank you for applying again. It's good to see you. Um, okay. My question is, and I don't think I asked this question, but what is the biggest planning issue or problem you see with the city today? I think the biggest planning issue I see in our city today is, is that's something I said before. It's affordable housing. Affordable housing doesn't just impact the people who need that affordable housing. Affordable housing impacts us all. It impacts us when we go to a restaurant. It impacts us when we go to the grocery store. It impacts us when we go to find a new house. Um, you know, recently my real estate agent reached out to me and said, you know, your house has gone up in value. And I said, well, that's really nowhere else I can go, even though I make a pretty decent salary and, and have a great house. And I think then that made me think, well, if I'm struggling with this question, what about people who are making half the money I am and, and who don't enjoy the same uh, lifestyle and income that I do? So I really think it's how do we fi fit context sensitive affordable housing into our community. I live near an affordable uh, housing project. I'm, I'm proud to live near it. Um, but one thing I'd really like to see this 
do is six, 12, 18 months later, how well that housing has integrated into the community from a transportation, traffic, parking, lighting, safety impacts, because I think that is where we can build the capacity with the community that affordable, the affordable housing need, we can accommodate and it can really be integrated seamlessly into our neighborhoods. And then, Mayor, just kind of a part B. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I understand affordable housing, especially, you know, as we're looking at our city um, at large. What about um, the older part of the city, the core of the city? Do you, I mean, again, affordable housing is one, but what other things do you see in that core, the more, you know, developed core of the city? Um, do you think are some problems or city issues, planning issues? And, and, and it's a great question. You know, I live in the Morris Heights neighborhood built when my mother was a young child in the 1950s. So I live in a neighborhood that is in, uh, not the oldest part of Aurora, but one of them. And one thing I will tell you that I struggle with, even though I'm pretty close to, to Denver, to our more established parts of the city, is I still am having trouble accessing neighborhood services, um, dentist appointments, doctors, um, you know, the grocery stores I want to shop at. So I really think it's how do we smartly redevelop for not only the people we want to attract to our community, but the people we already have here. What are those services? What are their needs? I think the family marketplace is an example. Um, you know, they did a program where they went out to the community and asked, you know, we want to do a community garden grow vegetables for you. What vegetables are you seeking? I think it's that kind of partnership where we are actively engaging our residents to see what we can do and how can we can accommodate them while we also plan for our growth. Thank you, uh, Councilmember O'Connell. All right, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Stephen, for uh, your continued interest in serving our city in this capacity. Uh, so my question for you today is, if you are appointed, do you see opportunity in your role to work with council to ensure that our code is serving our residents as well as possible? And if so, could you please provide us with an example of such an opportunity? Yeah, I think I absolutely do see the role. I, I think, you know, we have to work together. We have to be partners because the work that I do in review on planning and zoning commission could ultimately be reviewed by you. And I want you to be able to stand by that work. Um, you know, I think those opportunities are, I think I'll go back to the East Bank Shopping Center. I heard a lot of interest in small business retention and what are you doing to integrate the community around you? So in conversations with um, Council Member Coombs and anyone else who is interested about how do we, if that's really where we want to go as a policy and as a community with our elected leaders, how do we again integrate that into our process so that the community and the applicant can really see we're doing that? I think it's just so important to have cooperation and that policymakers or council members can have those conversations with this commission since the work is so closely aligned. And since we're reviewing projects against um, this council's adopted plans. All right, thank you. Council Member Medina. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Stephen, for your opinion. Uh, my question is, what are your thoughts around the ways the city can plan better for walkability and density issues? Yeah, really interesting that you bring those issues up because uh, I, I actually walk to the Peoria station and take the A-line every day that I go to work in downtown Denver. And it's it's a really kind of interesting track because I'm going through an industrial park where I can tell where codes changed when development was built because I can tell by the sidewalks that they have. Um, I think it's really, it's gotta be a commitment. It's gotta be a partnership. If we want greater walkability, support our property owners it says I understand it you know the responsibility of the maintenance of those most of those facilities are on that adjacent property owner even though they exist in a public rights of way um, so I think it's really how do we calibrate that infrastructure so that people can feel comfortable and empowered walking you know I will say that I've got to cross Smith Road I've got to cross there and more Parkway and it is a challenge each and every time and it, it does take some determination, but if we want people to use these options, it can't be so challenging. And I think density, you know, I would really lean into where does that density work? Does it work on corridors? Does it work in regional centers? 
Or is there that opportunity to potentially put gentle density or neighborhood scale density on some of our churches that may be relocating or may have closed? So I think it's really how do we calibrate that density to work for our community in a way that is compatible and meets the community's needs. Uh, Council Member um, Murillo. Council Member Sundberg. Hello, oh, Steve. Uh, if you could be in charge of a parade of homes for attainable housing, what would those homes look like? Yeah, that's a really great question. I think it's a question that we all ask ourselves, whether you're staff, whether you're a citizen, whether you're a council member. You know, one thing that I see is there's a mix of land and the amount of building that you have. So I think, you know, we have to go smaller. We have to go smaller lot size. We have to make the cost of the housing align with what people can afford to pay for it. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of really great ideas. You know, I worked on Denver's group living amendment, which allowed for temporary tiny home villages. Um, you know, what I'm starting to see is this kind of interesting policy wrinkle between temporary tiny home villages and mobile home parks. And it's really been interesting to see kind of a sea change attitude towards mobile home people who live in them as a way to afford people. Um, I think if that's where we want to go, though, it can't just be about zoning and planning. It has to be about aligning our building and fire codes to get us to those outcomes. So that parade of homes would be a tiny home, would be potentially a temporary tiny home, would be a 600 square foot house. Let's go back to some of the things that worked in the past that really gave us the affordability that we really need today. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Zavani. Uh, no questions for me, Steve. Thanks for applying. Thank you so much. Uh, Stephen, uh, thank you again for applying and for your interest in, in serving our city on the Planning and Zoning um, Commission. And uh, you have one minute for concluding remarks. Yeah, thank you all so much for this interview. Um, you know, I'm really passionate about our city and how we grow and when we grow. You know, it's why I've applied for this again. It's why I went to the Denver Board of Ethics and they have cleared me. Uh, should you choose to appoint me for this position? I just really think it's important, you know, that, you know, there is going to be some gray area. There is going to be some decisions that have to be made. And you know how I make my decision will be informed on a site visit because I truly don't think you can plan for an actual site until you visit it. It will be a review of the staff report. It will be a review of you know what has have people said and what has the how has the applicant responded, and it will be relying on professional staff where my I don't have the expertise, um, but I really am you know. I am a proponent of property rights. I'm a proponent of public service. And I really do see this as an implementing position of the of the um, goals and policies and plans that you have approved. And it's really my job to help implement them as best I can. And I just want to thank you all for this opportunity. Stephen, thank you very much. I deeply appreciate your interest in serving our city. Thank you so much. Uh, the time is now six. Uh, 619, uh, uh, council will stand in recess until 645.
The Aurora City Council for Monday, April 18, 2022 is called the order. Um, uh, no items from the mayor or issue updates. Um, is there any objection uh, to moving the consent calendar forward? Item number 4A. Seeing none, item number 4A will move forward. Um, item number 5A, IT Lease Purchase Authority. Uh, Scott Newman, Chief Information Officer. Good evening, Mayor and members of council. Scott Newman, I am the Chief Information Officer for the city. Uh, we are bringing this ordinance forward to authorize, uh, with your approval, authorize the IT department to enter into lease purchase agreements. Uh, we did this process last year through a formal resolution. And by doing so, we were able to uh, lock in the cost of some of our ongoing renewal items for the same rate for three years running, which saved the city close to $50,000 over the three year term. Uh, going forward, we'd like to be able to continue to do those same approaches with other contracts that we have in place. Additionally, we do have some large uh, ticket capital purchases that are needed over the next several years. Um, and the IT capital allotment annually in the budget does not cover that full amount up front. So by having the authority to enter into lease purchase agreements, we can distribute that cost over a number of years and um, move forward with the purchases we need to. Um, even though the uh, leases we entered last year were approved through a resolution, when we worked with outside bond council, they actually recommended an ordinance to authorize IT to do this so that we comply with the IRS reporting laws uh, required around um, tax exempt funding to be used on lease purchases. And with that, Mr. Mayor, any questions? Uh, questions of, of staff? Uh, seeing none, is there any objection to moving number 5A forward? Uh, seeing none, 5A will move forward. Item number 5B, resolution adopting the Youth Violence Prevention Program 2022 Strategic Plan Christina Ampera, Ampera. Good evening, if I can um, get sharing permissions, please. Thank you, let me just pull up my PowerPoint. I am sorry, I'm just having some technical issues here. Um, Chris, if you are on, would you be able to pull up the slide and share that for us? Yes, I'm working on that too. Uh, Adrian, if I could get sharing Thank privileges. Perfect. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chris. And I apologize for that. I um, am having a little bit of a technical issue with my access to PowerPoint. Um, but Chris will be able to show her screen and move us through the um, presentation that we have for you all today. Um, so today's goal is for you to receive a presentation on the program's um, strategic plan. And we thank you for the continued support and um, willingness to um, support our overall efforts. If we can go to the next slide. Over the last year, the program has completed a community needs assessment survey, researched best practices and national models, and has worked alongside a very diverse group of stakeholders to help inform the overall strategic plan that you all have received. Next slide. 
we have created a collaborative YVP network that has been very active and has been meeting over the last year in these different work, work groups that you see outlined here in this slide to help guide us and support and inform our collaborative efforts to address and, and reduce the overall youth violence that we're seeing within the city. The representatives in our work groups range from youth, criminal justice partners, school district staff, community leaders, and a number of different service providers. Having this level of support and representation from the different stakeholders has offered and has provided access to key leaders and subject matter experts that have been um, providing ongoing supports to developing the strategic plan that you have um, in your backup documentation. Next. So as you can see on this slide, um, we have testimonials from our stakeholder, um, one of the youth and, and parents that we're directly providing case management supports to, as well as from a representative from our Youth Advisory Council. Um, so as you can see, we have seen a lot of success in being able to work collaboratively with a number of different stakeholders by supporting the leveraging of resources, developing new programming efforts, building new connections and capacity of those serving the city of Aurora to respond to the continued need to address um, the impact of youth violence in, in our overall city. Um, our program specialists have been working um, individually, individually with the youth that have been referred to the program and have been providing mentorship and system navigation supports to youth referred by a number of different stakeholders, including Aurora Police, Arapahoe Human Services, um, Aurora Schools, and um, Juvenile Assessment Centers, just to name a few. To date, um, youth and families are engaging in these individualized case management supports, and we have seen some level of behavioral change. And we've also seen that our program is now becoming and being known as a resource hub for the city when it comes to youth services. Our Youth Advisory Council is now made up of 19 Aurora youth, and all of the, the youth have tremendously grown over the last year. They've um, learned a ton of um, leadership skills, They've led service projects, they've participated in youth outings, they've provided youth voice and program development efforts, and most importantly, they continue to advocate for themselves and other youth and provide their real, real life experience when it comes to how um, violent behavior is impacting their everyday life. Next. So the Aurora approach aims to duplicate national models that are evidence-based that include a public health approach, the comprehensive gang model, cure violence, and other local efforts that are nationally recognized. Um, so these um, are some of the, those models that you see on this slide. Next. In your supporting documentation, you should have a copy of this slide deck, um, which you can reference in more detail and includes this SWOT analysis. So as you can see, um, based on this SWOT analysis, there's a lot of strengths, but there's also a lot of areas of opportunity that this program will seek to address um, when it comes to addressing um, the overall impact of violent behavior when it comes to our youth, um, and also um, how we can work collaboratively to do so. So as you can see, just to name a few examples, we want to ensure that we're implementing a regional response to address the delinquent and violent behavior that are crossing, that's crossing from one municipality into another, and um, moving our providers to work in a, in a multidisciplinary response and a collective response rather than a siloed response that we've seen in the past. Next. So this map shows you the highest impacted communities within the city based off of the community needs assessment that was completed. So the areas with the highest impacted um, impact of risk factors includes um, violent behavior, substance use, mental health needs, to name a few. But as you can see, um, there is a high level of impact in specific communities, which is why um, a specialized strategic approach is needed um, to address the impacts of what those communities are experiencing. The next slide will show you um, the top violent behaviors and risk factors impacting more youth. Um, and in seeing this list, what you can see is many of these behaviors are very complex and require a specialized response, which is even more of a reason why we want to ensure we're taking that multidisciplinary response that we know is required to address these different risk factors that are impacting our youth and families. Okay. Next. 
the overall YDP model is, um, or program efforts are really broken down into these four different categories. The first one is taking that collective response that I mentioned through those um, different youth or work groups that the program has been able to, to develop. Um, providing funding to the community. So we have released the notice of funding opportunity um, where we will seek to fund community providers that can address the gap in services that we know our youth and families can benefit from having access to. Um, and then the intervention response, which is where a lot of the prior A-group efforts are being duplicated. And then that prevention response, which we know is critical. We know that um, implementing uh, a, a balanced approach that's inclusive of intervention and prevention efforts is key to ensure that we're seeing the level of reduction of delinquent and, and violent behavior that we want to see. Next. The strategic plan is broken down into these five different areas. So um, we are seeking to implement programming ranging from program development, organizational change, focusing on the intervention category or programming and as well as every entry support, secondary prevention and primary prevention. Um, and so this will support that multidisciplinary response that we will seek to implement, um, but also support immediate and also long-term efforts that we know we want to be able to see within our efforts. Next. For program development, um, as an example, we want to ensure that we um, continue to um, build trust in our community. We want to ensure that we continue to expand on the program's brand to support the program becoming that the hub, the, the city's resource hub when it comes to um, youth services. We want to be a support to our police officers, to our courts. We want to ensure that if a community member is in need of a resource that they know to contact us so we can connect them to the right person. We also want to ensure that we continue to assess um, how our community is being impacted by violent behavior. Next. Under organizational change, I mentioned um, the goal is to move us away from working in the silo to response to really um, increasing capacity and awareness of what are those resources, what are what is the programming, what is that collective effort that we need to ensure we're implementing to reduce those risk factors and increase those protective factors within our city. Um, so we want to ensure that we're developing key um, collaboratives with um, stakeholders to ensure that we're working together to address the violent behavior. Next. Under the intervention category, um, we are moving towards developing a multidisciplinary team. Our intervention work group has been meeting since May of, of 2021 to get us to a point where we're, we're a couple of months off of um, the initial kickoff of our multidisciplinary team. Um, that team will receive referrals of youth, both high-risk and at-risk youth, um, and assess them to determine what is the best um, resource to put in place for that family, whether it's through one of the program's outreach specialists or refer out to one of the, the key stakeholders that's at the table to address the immediate needs the family has. Um, that group will continue to assess ongoing um, supports to the youth and families to ensure that we're seeing some level of behavioral change, um, but also to support us in developing that case management support or response that we want to see. Um, next. What you see here is the targeted population the program is seeking to address. Um, again, as we know, um, when it comes to addressing um, the overall impact of, of youth violence, we want to ensure that we are looking at best practices and we know that addressing um, the overall community, the vulnerable communities is uh, a, a primary prevention um, effort that we need to ensure we're inclusive of, um, but also that we're identifying who are those youth that are, are at risk, that are starting to exhibit some level of behavior that we can intervene in time to keep them from reaching that um, higher level of intervention um, support that they need. Um, for those youth that are actively already, for example, involved in the criminal justice system, actively already connected to some of the violent crime that may be happening, ensuring that we're putting in place supports for those individuals as well as their families. Um, and then lastly, ensuring that we have supports in place for those youth that are um, re-entering our community after being detained for some time. Next. I mentioned our, our multidisciplinary team. This is the criteria that that team has um, developed in ensuring that we're prioritizing who is serving services, but also to ensure that as we move forward with our multidisciplinary effort, we're all on the same page as far as um, what youth falls under the prevention 
middle prevention slash intervention category, and then who's considered high risk or um, what, who will be considered under that intervention category. Um, so this is important for us to have in place to ensure that if I get a referral from human services, for example, um, or from the school that we're um, essentially um, prioritizing their needs to the best of our, of our ability alongside our, our partners. Next slide. Um, under our secondary prevention category, we have over the last um, eight months developed a pretty strong working relationship with the Royal Police Department, in particular with our Crimes Against Children's Unit, where they have been actively referring youth that have been reported as runaway that are, are already exhibiting some level of at-risk or high-risk um, behavior. Um, those youth have, have been able to either be referred to um, outside mentorship supports, to um, the Juvenile Assessment Center for further assessments, um, or have been assigned to one of the outreach specialists for that individualized case management support that we've mentioned before. To date, that's been a very um, critical and um, effective partnership with APD. Um, we've been able to communicate back to them as far as progress with some of the youth, but also maintain them up to date as far as some connections that we may be seeing that should be they should be aware of. Next, primary prevention. Um, our safe haven response has been one of the strategies that our community mobilization team has been actively working on over the last several months. This is a strategy that was implemented initially in Aurora back in November after the um, uh, uh, Nome Park and Hinckley shooting, where our faith-based leaders were able to open up their doors and offer a safe space for community to convene, access mental health services, um, but also a space for them to connect with providers. Um, there were uh, very effective responses where community members were able to access services and also report um, crime that ha they had experienced themselves. And so this there is a group of service or uh, faith-based leaders that have been meeting um, along with mental health providers to further develop the Safe Haven Council and a response within the city of Aurora. Next. So we are here today to ask um, the support from our council to be able to move our um, strategic plan forward to the next um, council meeting. Uh, questions of staff? Yes, Mayor. Uh, Mayor Bateau. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, you, it, in a couple of the slides, I got a little bit confused as to how much effort we're putting on intervention versus prevention. Because, um, for example, on the one slide with the um, fun, funding the faith based organization, um, that seems like more prevention than intervention. Um, and the youth. Advisory Council, um, the Parks and Rec part, that all to me was what we talked about in the past as prevention. So I, I, I mean, I think we were saying we were gonna do 80% of our funding towards intervention and 20% towards prevention. So um, can you tell me how we're focusing on the intervention? And I know you mentioned the 18th Judicial. I think obviously that's a really good, um, um, partner uh, to um, to get referrals from, and then you mentioned the schools, and I think um, if you can also address um, some of the things you you did learn, because I, I I think I heard from the SROs that they do deal with kind of pretty violent kids sometimes. Yes, um, definitely, and I can bring. Um, it looks like my PowerPoint is working. If I can sh um, get share access to bring up the intervention slide. Up and I can answer that um, question further. Um, so as I'm getting access to um, be able to share, uh, so under the intervention category, we're prioritizing three three strategies. Um, so the first goal is to um, de further develop the um, multidisciplinary team. So that's the team you mentioned, the SROs. Um, for example, the the school resource officers will be able to. Um, refer to us um, youth, they've identified youth that can benefit from receiving individualized um, case management mentorship supports from our outreach specialist. And so the system that we have in place now is that those SROs can directly refer those youth to us, outreach to me, 
um, have us respond to some of those goals and work collaboratively with them. We've also partnered with our SROs to help support the development of a, a, a district APS district specific MDT team where the SROs school staff to include counselors, um, their, their disciplinary staff and someone from the district are meeting. We're meeting once a month to discuss very specific cases. Okay. Um, so other goal Oh, just, I'm sorry. Um, so when, so if you get a referral from an SRO, you're, you're, you're getting them counseling right away. It depends on. So when the, the initial step that we get, when we get a referral from the SRO is to outreach to the parent and the youth to ensure that they want to engage in services, but also directly hear from them. What are the needs that you have? What supports do you want in place? Who are you actively working with? Okay. At the same time, simultaneously, we're getting feedback from the SRO of here's the school staff that's already been assigned to work with the youth. Okay. We'll reach out to that school staff to ensure that we're aware of what supports they're putting in place. Some schools have access to in school mental health services. Some schools have limited resources. And so we're able to get an idea from the school of what behaviors they're seeing and what supports based on their evaluations they think we should put in place. Okay. My team, the outreach specialist, will then um, meet in, in person with the family and further do uh, a, a more detailed assessment and determine from there what type of case plan will develop. Some require mental health, some require victim assistance, a safety plan. It really depends on the, that individualized response. Based on that individualized response, we'll make the connections to the service provider in the metro area that can best address that need. Sometimes it is mental health, sometimes it's other other services, um, but the approach we're taking is that individualized response to ensure that we're supporting that youth and family the best the best we can. Okay. Um, I notice on you know the the ten different areas with gang violence, domestic violence, gun violence, emotional abuse, that type of thing. Where is substance abuse? Because I would imagine there's a correlation, you know, possibly. <laughs> Yeah, um, so that's where um, uh, substance abuse, as you as you see these different, um, the list of the different violent behavior and risk factors, what we are seeing is that that individualized response is very, very important. And us doing that individualized assessment is key um, because it'll help us understand what impacts the youth have. We may have a youth that has a nexus to substance use, mental health, but also victimization, a past victimization of sexual abuse, and now has some tie to gang, gang violence. And so we want to ensure that we're understanding what are those risk factors and impacting that specific youth, and then from there be able to build their response. Substance use we know is a major you know, risk factor impacting war youth, um, which is why um, our program is working pretty closely with Aurora Partners for Thriving Youth, who's primarily focusing on developing a response to addressing um, controlled substance use by youth. And you will follow that individual through whatever, like if they, you know, whatever resource they're um, referred to, you would, you would circle back with them, right? Correct. Yes. So the outreach specialist, depending on the case plan that we're seeing and the case plan that the multidisciplinary team will, will continue to develop, um, the outreach specialist are meeting with um, the youth um, face to face, either weekly or bi weekly, depending on the need. And um, they do have weekly contact with both the youth and the parent or the caregiver. All right. Thank you. For the questions of staff, Mayor, Councilmember uh, Lawson. Councilmember Lawson. Yeah, I just have a couple questions. Thank you for the presentation. Um, the question I have for you is the first one is um, this framework, this strategic framework, where did the development happen? I mean, uh, where did you, it seems like this may be, I know this might be some of Denver's, some of um, other, other, other maybe people's strategic plan, but because uh, it's really, it's, it's somewhat Aurora specific, but then it's somewhat different. So can you tell me first, where, where did this strategic plan, the foundation of this, um, how did you establish this? And where did it come from? Yes, um, so a good question. Um, the efforts that we took in complete, completing the community needs assessment comes directly from the public health approach, as well as the comprehensive game model. Um, so um, completing that needs assessment is key based on those national models. Most of the questions, most of how we structured the, the survey and the individual interviews and focus groups 
um, those uh, scripts came from both of those models to ensure that we were collecting the, the information that um, by evidence-based efforts in the past have shown will give us the, the information that we need to be able to collect and review. Um, from there, we were able to identify the immediate risk factors um, and immediate needs based on what the community was saying, um, but also what some of that preliminary data was showing. From there, we were able to pull um, very specific strategies that are outlined in the, in the strategic framework um, that we can implement based on evidence-based practices that we know have been effective, but that we also have been able to tie to um, being able to implement and address what's happening within the city. Some of those efforts come from pure violence. For example, the use of violence interrupters, the use of outreach specialist outreach workers com comes from the comprehensive gang model. Um, and some of the, the um, responses that we're implementing do come from local efforts, such as the safe haven, such as how we're partnering with SROs, APD, um, specialized units to refer, um, get the referrals from them and also developing the multidisciplinary team response to ensure we're developing that individualized case plan. Mayor, can I just continue my questioning? Please continue, please continue. Um, so, my, so my next question to you is, um, are you fully staffed and can you tell me your staffing right now? Yes, um, so I currently have one outreach specialist um, who's bilingual. I have one outreach, one, one of the coordinators, the prevention coordinators that's starting next Monday. Um, we have made an offer for a second outreach specialist. Um, we have tentatively identified the, the last outreach specialist that we'll bring on. And then the last position that we will be recruiting for is the intervention coordinator. Okay, so um, one of the things that I kind of find interesting, and I asked this at the Denver Compact, is um, I, first of all, one of the strategic points for strategy one to me should be to get fully staffed. Um, having just two outreach specialists and I guess with what we're dealing with now, and that's one of the things I brought up at the compact is when we have a, a youth that has been shot, you know, what is the, what do we do to coordinate? And of course, there are some issues with resources and we're kind of using Denver to kind of help us. And then we have here in Aurora, but we only have two outreach specialists. And I, I know we've been talking about staffing, but to me, that should be number one strategic plan and getting the staffing because we, the outreach worker, workers to me are essential to that connectivity to get these um, youth to the resources that they're needed. And also to reach out to when there is a critical incident that happens, that we have someone to actually go out there and to address the issues with the, maybe that youth if they choose to speak or and their family which I'm not seeing that happening. What I'm seeing throughout a lot of the meetings I've attended is a lot of meetings, a lot of meetings, a lot of things just happening. And I know for sure that you're kind of going out there and doing more of the prevention, which is fine if that's what you believe is the prevention is the key, but it's difficult for when I'm asked to go out and speak because I wanna talk about intervention and both but we're kind of mixed messaging. And so that's why a lot of events I just don't go to because of the messaging that you're putting out. And then I, you know, we as a council said 80% intervention, which to me is in this, in this strategy, but it doesn't really address what we need now. Every day a youth is getting shot or something is happening and we're not, I'm just trying to figure out how we're addressing that and how is that gonna be embedded in the strategic plan, which I think you have it in there, but I just don't know how we're actually really dealing with stuff that we're dealing, that we have to deal with right now. So yeah. Yeah. I guess, I mean, I, it's a question and then it's a comment. So if you can address my question, that would be great. I think you and I and your, your we're very divided on possibly <laughs> what we should be dealing with. And that's fine. You're probably more of the expert. Like you said, we need to know more about youth violence, but if you see what's going on now in the city, youth are getting shot every single day, jurisdictionally, Denver and Aurora. And I'm just trying to figure out how, what, what strategy, which should be to me in strategic planning, how we're gonna be dealing with those incidents, critical incidents that we're dealing with pretty much on an everyday basis in Aurora. So if you could address that question, um, not so much my comment because we just have difference of opinion on some things about prevention and intervention at this time. Council Member Lawson, this is Jessica Prosser. I just wanted to chime in. We have had um, at times um, a majority of the positions filled. We've 
unfortunately, um, over the course of the year, the program have had three people hired and three people leave. And so, um, like many of our areas around the city, you know, recruitment and retention has um, also been a struggle. But I also just wanted to really highlight that this plan is in alignment with the resolution that you brought forward in February in terms of how the funding will be allocated. And so there is those four different areas of the plan, but the way that the funding will be allocated, I do think, um, you know, the intention and I hope what we'll see is that we'll have a lot more emphasis on intervention because we'll be spending a lot more resources on that, both from a staffing perspective and the amount of funding that we're putting out to the community. Um, so I know the the other thing that was not mentioned during this presentation is that we are um, going through the notice of funding opportunity process, and that will be aligned with that resolution, um, meeting the goals of this plan, but also meeting those funding objectives. So we're going to be a lot more heavily looking at the intervention piece than the prevention piece through that process. And thank you, Jessica, for that. I guess I understand about the notice of funding, but then if you look at, if you articulate what is actually in this, in this strategic plan, you can do the notice of funding, but the strategic plan, to me, those are two different things, but they kind of align. I see, I guess I'm just, I see what you're saying. It aligns in terms of what the resolution says in terms of what we were going to do for funding, but I don't actually see everything articulated from the resolution so much in the strategic planning. So I guess, um, you know, I know that we had a strategic plan that we had said that the resolution required. Um, I know that you guys went to um, housing, um, the housing committee, but you haven't went to um, actually to the public safety committee, which I know that may be coming up because of, you know, they had a full, case last time. But I guess my question is, I mean, I want to support, I'm gonna, I, I want to support the strategic plan because it is something that we did adopt in this resolution that we wanted to see. I just think that there's very hidden things in here in terms of what we were seeing before. And um, that's kind of where I have some issues with this. So um, that's just my opinion on this resolution right now. Further uh, questions of staff? Mayor Sorensky. Council Member Jorinsky. Thank you. Um, first, I just wanna echo what Council Member Lawson just said about just having so many meetings about um, youth violence and, and gang violence and, and we're having all these meetings and um, these shootings are, are not only not stopping, but I see them increasing. And one thing, uh, one thing that was presented to me in the past was a program the police department um, was doing, and I think it was statewide, um, different departments send police officers to this camp postcard uh, program. And I think what I liked most about that program is you know, at this point, this is a compounding problem. And when we're talking youth violence, when we're talking gang violence and, and we're talking intervention and different things like that. I mean, sometimes, you know, especially in today's society, you know, they, they have this reputation that they have to uphold and they have to, you know, be a, be a certain way and, and, and have this certain image. And one thing I really liked about the camp postcard program was that they get these kids out of their environment and they take them up to the mountains and they spend a weekend you know, doing whatever they're doing and they're in plain clothes. Um, and then at the end of the weekend, they all you know, would come out in their uniform or whatever and reveal that they're actually police officers and, and these kids are, are blown away. And a program uh, that was presented to myself and council member Lawson recently was um, Urban Nature Impact. Um, and they had said that they had gone to you guys, uh, you know, to try and go through the RFP process and see if there's any funding available. But one thing I liked about their program is it's very similar in the sense that they will go to these kids, you know, these parks, these known gang hangouts, um, they will go and they will intervene. And, and, you know, this is a group of men and women made up of, of 
former gang members themselves. Some of them have done several years in prison. Um, some of them have never been in trouble with the law at all, but, you know, want to teach um, art or music, uh, you know, to, to some of these kids. And, and I like that that program really mirrored that as far as getting these kids out of Aurora and out of their element. And, and I, I can't help but think that some of these kids that we're talking about maybe maybe have never been to the mountains, mm -hmm. maybe have never been fishing. Um, so I thought that this was a really, really creative program that I certainly would like to see uh, come into Aurora. And I really just wanted to um, to let you guys know how I feel about that. And, and I think we need to start thinking about this. I'm happy the A-GRIP program is coming back, you know, different things. I don't think that there's uh, any cost we should spare to to keep our children alive and, and stop these shootings. Um, and I just hope that you guys will really take a look at uh, Urban Nature Impact. I was very, very impressed with uh, their program. Okay. Yes. And um, Urban Nature Impact um, did apply for the NOCO funding, and they have also expressed interest in being part of goal two and goal three of um, under the intervention um, strategy, which is uh, exactly what you're talking about. Council member Lawson is developing a critical incident response that we would implement within the city using outreach workers and violence interrupters, um, and then also developing the Aurora outreach team. Um, that we have actively been um, building to ensure that we have that critical incident response, which we have implemented after several shootings within the city. Just one more thing, Mayor, if I can. Please. When will we know? Um, I know, you know, th there's different nonprofits, you know, applying right now, and Urban Nature Impact is one of them. When will we know uh, how this funding is going to be divvy, yes. divvy out? Yes, so um, the, um, and, and Jessica was completely right where the majority of the funding is going towards intervention efforts. Um, the review panel has until the end of this week to review and score the applications. Um, the review um, committee will be meeting on Friday to finalize and identify who will be awarded. Um, and then we'll be coming back in front of council on May 5th to present um, those recommendations. Great. Uh, Christina, Mike Hoffman, when is the deadline for submitting those applications? Uh, uh, the proposals? The, yes, uh, the deadline was March 28th. Okay, thank you. Mayor Zavonik. Uh, Councilmember Zavonik. Yeah, Christina, I a uh, quick question for you. What, if any, data do we have over the last, say, 12, 18, maybe even two years um, time frame? Well, I, I see in you, you have a, a the slide that talks about the types of violence. Do we have an idea of what, what are the three most prevalent um, instances of youth violence? Is it gang violence? Is it uh, drug, you know, is it dealing with substance abuse and, and dealing, or do we have that side type of data? Um, the the data is listed actually, actually in rank based on, on what's being experienced by youth, what's being reported. Yeah, as so experience. gang violence is one. So that most types of, that's that's actual ranking. That's just not the listing that way. Okay, yes. so. Um, gang violence. So, so, so uh, Mayor Pro Tem's uh, question about substance abuse, I would assume, and maybe I'm completely wrong because it's not even listed on here, but drug dealing, substance abuse is not in the top 10. The, the substance use is one that considered a risk factor. So it's in the bottom um, part of the risk yeah. factors, but it's not listed as a violent behavior. Got it. But it Got is it. a top risk factor impacting youth. Okay, and then, uh, Mayor, if I can, just one other question. Please. You had mentioned that the um, the SROs will make recommendations to you, and obviously at that point, the family has to accept service. Um, do you have data in terms of how many, or what the percentage are of, of families that accept service versus not? Actually, all of the families are wanting services. We haven't had a case yet to date where the caregiver is saying, we don't want you to work with us. Um, we have had a couple of cases where we have struggled okay. with the youth, but it's taking us just a little bit longer to engage them. But as far as the caregivers, they're wanting the help. Got it. Okay, thank you. That's all I had. Further, further questions? Mayor. Uh, Councilmember McConnell. 
Thank you, sir. And uh, thank you, Christina, for the presentation and Jessica for also jumping in. Uh, and I'm actually really relieved to hear that you haven't had anyone turn you away yet. Uh, that was something that was, you know, on my mind after we saw the uh, data that we had from the last time we ran the AGRIP program where there were, I think it was something like 60% of people for whatever reason eventually turned us away. So I'm really, really happy to hear that. And just to be clear, you haven't had anyone turn you away up front. Uh, and they're not losing touch with the program. They're staying enrolled in it and receiving services? Yes, correct. Wonderful. That is really great news. Thank you. Um, I did have a question for you around data collection. Um, I noticed in the summary, you mentioned that we were struggling with data, uh, data collection. Um, part of that was due to COVID, but part of that seemed to be that we weren't really gathering the same information points. Um, and then I didn't see any way to rectify that in the strategic plan, nor did I really see data collection uh, mentioned in the strategic plan much at all. Uh, and I'm concerned about that because I think this kind of ties back into something some of my colleagues have said. Um, you know, if we're going to intervene, which, you know, is the direction that the majority of council wanted to take, uh, we need to know how to intervene. And from my perspective to do that, we need to know, you know, we need to have information to really guide uh, our methods there. So um, what's that look like? Yes, and that's um, part of our ongoing performance measures. So it would fall under our goal one under program development. We would implement continued um, uh, data collection efforts in the different work groups to ensure that we're collecting not just performance measures for the program, but the overall collective approach that we're um, wanting to, to see implemented. Um, and also continued receiving continued supports. We, we do have a data group that's meeting um, that was really key in, in helping us complete the community needs assessment, but that group is continuing to identify what violent behaviors do we want to continue to track, what behaviors do we want to look at, how do we define, you know, a gang member, for example, has been a conversation in the past. Um, yeah. So those are parts of conversations that we have continuously with our steering committee, our MDT team, and our other groups. Right, great, and I'm, I'm happy to hear about the gang member point specifically because I just spoke with our gang unit a couple of weeks ago and they repeated what I think we had heard, we've been hearing for over a year at this point, which is like there is some gang activity, but it's not the primary driver. But what you're showing us here is that it's ranked at number one. So there's a disconnect there. So I'm wondering, is, is that like because the information we have is bad or are the definitions um, that folks are using kind of fungible? So you know, what some folks, some folks might consider something gang violence that isn't technically gang violence, you know, uh, is that what's going on there? I'm just, I'm just curious because I want to make sure yeah. that we're all operating off of the same understanding. Yes. And, and I think um, one of the things that we will have to consider as we move forward is APD has their, based on their law enforcement suppressive response, a very specific lens in how they're defining gang violence as compared to what a school may use, as compared to what human okay. services may use. And so that's part of the factor and that's because we do have multidisciplinary response. We're all looking at this specific behavior in a different, from a different lens. And so how do we ensure that we're understanding what each other are doing, but how do we have that common language? And so that's part of our, our ongoing capacity building that we're gonna have to implement is how do we have that common language across the board? Um, but if we're identifying gang violence as being the top risk factor or top violent behavior impacting based on perception, um, then we have to look at the actual crime data. Um, but a lot of you know the, the, the perception that we have gotten as far as um, what we've heard from partners and community does match what gang unit is saying, where there is gang violence, but there's a lot of violent behavior that may have a nexus, but some that doesn't have a nexus to gangs. Okay, thank you. So I'm glad to hear that that's being uh, cleared up as well. And I, my last question for you um, is, as we are gathering, you know, uh, better data and kind of standardizing the, you know, what we're tracking, is that going to actually be shared with council? And, and to be clear, I'm asking for more than just, you know, kind of broad generalization, uh, you know, general categories. Um, if it's possible, I'd like us to anonymize this. Obviously, we want to protect, you know, confidentiality. But I'd like to know more about, like, the details of what our youth are experiencing and our and our families are experiencing, because um, I think that'll also help us uh, steer our policy making as well. Because I think that we have a strong role to play uh, in addressing youth violence as well. I think it's community, it's uh, the work you're doing through your program, uh, parents, but also you know us in our legislative capacity to ensure that we're providing for our residents. So, 
Yes, and um, we will plan on continuing to provide updates during the horns and public safety meetings. And part of what I've done for our intervention work group has um, been to report out specific trending around what's being seen, especially in our caseload, as well as within our critical incident response in the community. Um, so we'll, um, we can incorporate some of that information during those updates. So you all hear of that trending that we're seeing. All right, great. Thank you so much. Ms. Councilmember Marcano, if I can add just a comment to that data collection piece. Sure. We're also, also dovetailing with our public safety partnership consultants that are looking at the overall crime reduction strategies that they'll be advising to council so that they're working on specific strategies around youth violence reduction as well. And we'll be doing some data collection efforts and giving us some um, best practices to look at for that. Councilmember Coombs. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so following on this data conversation, um, some of what I noticed, and maybe this is contributing to kind of some of the mixed messages or different perceptions that we're receiving is it looks like most of the people that participated as stakeholders were probably parents and very few youth actually participated. It looks like 10, um, youth under the age of 24 and 13 people under the age of 25 um, participated or under the age of 30, sorry, participated in that stakeholdering process. And so I guess my question is, how are we gonna make sure we're actually getting the information directly from youth, not just the perceptions of their parents about what's going on um, and then are we making sure that the youth we're engaging with are really the high risk youth? And how are we going to make sure that we're contacting high risk youth and not youth that maybe would just be more generally inclined to engage and to participate in activities in general? Yes, so the um, report that you're referencing as far as the individual, um, the individual individual interviews was one part of the report we did get over the 600 responses from the survey which 70 percent of those responses did come from youth and so the report that you have in front of you doesn't include the survey responses uh, and but that's part of the appendix so you'll be able to reference that that data toolkit to be able to see those responses that were primarily given by um the aurora youth um so that's how we were able to capture not just the list of violent behavior, but also the risk factors is both through individual interviews, focus groups, and then the surveys. So altogether, we um, interviewed almost 600 and um, 600 and, and, and um, yeah, over 650 people. Um, as far as. Okay, I'm sorry, where. I didn't see that. Is it one of the links in the yes. appendix or oh, okay? So yeah. it's not in the actual printed backup. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Yeah. No problem. Um, but what we can also do is send a summary of the toolkit, which summarizes. It'll provide you a summary of um, the the response, the highlights of the responses from those six hundred surveys that were collected. So we can get that out. As far as um, how we're going to prioritize. Um, the high risk versus the at risk youth. Um, it's what we're seeing is a need to prioritize both based on, for example, what the SROs are saying. So if an SRO is saying, I know older brother just got um, detained for an attempted homicide case, and he has two younger siblings that are going to a middle school that, that aren't necessarily high risk, but they're at risk, and we want to ensure that they don't get recruited, we want to make sure that we're putting in place uh, a case plan for those individuals. Um, so we want to be um, considerate of how some of the at-risk youth are being impacted, um, which is why that criteria um, was developed by the multidisciplinary team that you can refer to. So when will be the next round of, of um, I, I would say, applications uh, of submittals for to be a part of the the, the grant process for nonprofits? Um, the so the this. The applications that were submitted this round, um, the total amount of funding requested was over 3 million and we only have 500,000 to distribute with 400,000 going towards intervention, 100 towards prevention. The second round of, of funding won't be until next year, so 2023. 
And what will be the, do you have a date for that? Not yet. No. Okay. Mayor. Uh, Mayor Fritz. I, uh, Mayor, I, yeah, I have a question on the, on the, oh, sorry, on the RFP process. Um, Please proceed, and then I'll go to Council Member Coombs. You want me to go? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. I'll, then I'll go back to Council Member Coombs. Okay, thank you. Um, on the RFP, you said you're meeting Friday um, to review the applications that you received, and um, how were how was that um, how was that outreach um, done to, on the RFP process? Because I I made a couple recommendations. I don't know if, if they got to you, um, but. Just wondering if they were included. Yes, yeah, so um, there was a lot of work done with our communications team with the city to get the word out about um, the opportunity through social media, through a lot of the outlets the city has. Um, we have a large distribution list that we, dist we um, distributed the announcement to. Um, there, there has been ongoing efforts to notify as many people. One of the major um, focuses of the program over the last year was to identify and engage stakeholders to ensure they were aware of the funding opportunity. Um, we did have over 50 organizations register and attend the Q&A sessions. We had a recorded, um, the, the, a recorded uh, version of the Q&A session available online where um, organizations were able to go and view the recording. Um, the recommendations um, that you made, Council uh, Council Member Bergen, um, were contacted and notified as well. Um, and out of um, those that expressed interest, we did receive 21 applications. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Further questions? Oh, Council Member Coombs. Yeah. Sorry, um, I did not get through all of that. So, um, a couple of minor questions one is just um what is the like how is the violence interruption um process and kind of the programming that we're going to do how are we going to make sure that there aren't any issues of those, those programs leading to potentially you circling back and engaging in more violence i have heard um, of some issues that have come up in our community of uh, programs that are supposed to be helping youth to work through issues and ended up actually resulting in kind of more conflict among youth that led to violence. So how are we preventing that um, is the first follow up. Yes, that's a, a very valid point. And that's um, why it's really important to ensure as we move forward with finding an organization to do the violence interruption, but also when we're um, actively um, initiating those critical incident responses, now that we're activating organizations that have the training, that have the know-how, that have um, the, the ethical um, um, training to be able to do the, 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 the work that we're hoping that they can do, um, that is evidence-based. What we have seen um, in the metro areas that there are organizations that are startup organizations or that don't have the training that want to do the work. But if they, you know, at times when they have responded, it does cause more of a problem because they don't have the training. So capacity building is really, really key. Um, but ensuring that um, we're having those ongoing um, Aurora outreach team um, collaborative meetings to ensure that we're all on the same page as far as how the response will look like and who will. Further questions? And then, oh, yes, Mayor. Please proceed. Um, the other question is, I know that a lot of the programming that we've seen is um, organizations that have already kind of been in place working with youth in our community, but are any of the current programs that we have worked with so far or the folks that we're looking to work with involved with supporting LGBTQ youth that are dealing with um, violence risk factors? Um, yes, um, so most of them are very open, but what we've also done through our um, outreach specialist is we have actually um, already contacted um, Color and Rainbow Alley for very specific cases. Um, for them to support um, specific supports that those youth need. Um, and so that is part of um, the importance of having that individualized 
approach that we're taking to ensure that we're connecting youth to the right resources that are going to benefit them. Awesome. And then just finally, with the continued data collection, I know, Carice, you mentioned um, kind of the public safety um, data collection. Who's doing the data collection now and who's going to be kind of doing the follow up on continuing to collect data for the city? Yes, yeah, so go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, so, as Christina mentioned, we have ongoing data collection within the program itself and then public safety partnership. They were just in Aurora last week uh, for their site visit to really interview stakeholders that are on the ground and they're developing strategies. So I think more to come on that. And I believe they presented at uh, the public safety committee last week uh, and can continue to give updates there to council. And it's also important for us to, um, through that collaborative effort, um, pull and review data that our partners are willing to share and discuss. So probation, how many youth do you have on probation for a gun charge? Courts, how many cases have you prosecuted? So um, part of the conversations that we have also had um, is how do we collect data from our partners um, and how do we evaluate that, that data? to ensure that we're collectively implementing um, proper procedures um, and processes to address what we're seeing within the trending. Further questions? Uh, seeing none, uh, is, there a, is there opposition to moving uh, item number five be forward? Mayor, I will be objecting because I think that there's a lot of gaps in this strategic plan, so I won't be supporting this at this time. Further objections? Uh, I'll object. Uh, I don't think it reflects uh, the resolution that um, staff was directed to do. Uh, yeah. Further objection? Mayor. Uh, Council Mayor Patim. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to object, but I, like I, if I found it really disappointing that the substance abuse wasn't even on this list um, when it's it should be way up there. Um, I, I don't want to object, but I think it needs to be refocused. It's a little bit, again, too broad, but hopefully with the funding, it'll narrow it down. Is there further objection? Zavonic. Uh, Zavonic. Let me see. Okay. Further objection? Mayor, I just also want to say that I, I don't want to object at this time, but I am I am uh, going to be watching um, the the organizations that are selected for funding um, with this, and and very well may may object at that time. Uh, with only um, uh, four uh, resident objection, uh, item number five. Uh, uh, B will move forward. Uh, item number 5C, 2022 state and federal priorities. Council Member Lawson. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, the priorities that are in the state and federal priorities that are in your backup, um, if you've read all of those, those were approved during the Pfizer committee meeting, approved by the Pfizer committee. Um, I guess if there's any questions or if anyone wants, any council member wants to pull one for further discussion and questions, um, we can have that discussion right now so is there anything that um any questions about any of the state and federal priorities or is there a specific one that you would like to have pulled for further discussion otherwise we would like to move these forward mayor zavonic uh council member zavonic so starting with um we'll start with state um i have a question about i think it's the renewable uh, here we go. The renewable energy standard expanding production for alternative energy and renewable energy standards. Wanted some information about what that means. Um, specifically, like what I mean, I already know that what our renewable energy standard is, and I just want to know what we're talking about extending it to. And then the second one is um, expanding tax credits to promote the use of electric vehicles and EV infrastructure. Um, again, I'm not I'm not sure I'm in support of expanding more credits for 
Tesla's, but let's go ahead and have that conversation. So those would be the two things that I have uh, questions about on the state side. I have a bunch on the federal. Okay, Roberto. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, um, on the electric vehicle, primarily it's for our own fleet and city's fleet and having the availability and accessibility for some of those options to do electric vehicle. We are looking at some of that for our own uh, fleet. It's not so much a generalized tax credit uh, discussion, but um, we can, and I don't have the actual renewable standard uh, present, and so I could probably bring that back to you at a study session on that particular item. Okay, yeah, I would I would like that. I mean, I guess it depends on if the majority of my colleagues would agree with me. And then you had other questions on other items. Yeah, so, yeah. So on the federal side, let me open this up. Um, on the federal priorities, there were a number of them that. So on the housing, we talk about investments and programs for providing permanent housing for people experiencing homelessness. What is, what is specifically, what legislation is that in the, at the federal level that would, we would be supporting in, in support of permanent supporting housing? Uh, and Jessica's on the call as well, but I would say that in general, these priorities, some of them are specific to legislation. Some of them are more broader policy statements that we would be supportive of those efforts were they to come forward. So I don't, I, looking at the language that we have on that one, it was probably a more a generalized priority that is looking for HUD and their funding priorities to be providing broad continuum of housing options to include transitional housing, shelter housing, all of the different programs they have in that priority. As I recall, I think we were just looking for uh, continued funding in that area and not a specific piece of legislation. But if Jessica has any other uh, insights on that, she can chime in. Yeah, Councilmember Zvonik, that's true. It would just be for the continued level funding or more funding for things like home funding that we use for our community investment process where we um, you know, provide gap funding for new affordable units, uh, preservation of units, uh, things like that. So um, those all come before you, but not specific legislation. Okay. On the um, uh, where it says the city supports or requests Congress to support the following, and there's the Housing Its Infrastructure Act. What does that do? So more of the same. So providing funding for the you know the ability to incentivize essentially affordable housing in your community. So the infrastructure uh, pieces of that, and I believe. There's more to come on that, so I have not seen all of the specifics on that yet. Okay, and then on uh, there's one on police reform talks about um, ending qualified immunity, um, which I think we've seen the disastrous effects of ending it here in the state. I'm not sure it's a good idea for the city to take position on that, but I assume it's just aligning the uh, federal law with the state law. That's accurate. Okay, uh, I don't have any other questions, but I object to moving forward with these as they are. Uh, is there, um, uh, without objection, uh, uh, what I'd like to do is uh, the um, federal uh, items that uh, um, Council Member Zavonik has identified, if we could delay those for two weeks and allow staff to have more information on that uh, and bring that forward at, at the next study session. Is there objection to doing that? I see none than that, then that's the direction that we'll take. Um, uh, further discussion on item number 5C. Yeah. I think, um, sorry. Sorry, it took me a sec to unmute. Um, do I have the floor? Yes, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, so going back to the state priorities, uh, one of the bullets under climate change is pursuing green building standards. Um, can we elaborate a little more about what that entails? Is that adopting the International Green Construction Code or um, something else? I believe so, but uh, since Council Member Zabonik called that out, we can bring more back uh, additional okay. information on the specific request. Is, yes. there objection, is, is there objection to delaying that for two weeks uh, till, so staff can have more information? Uh, without objection, then that's the direction we'll take on that one. Uh, further uh, questions? Uh, seeing none, is there an objection to moving the rest of 5C forward? 
uh, seeing none, then the rest of 5C minus the, uh, the items identified uh, will move forward. Uh, item number 6A, 2022 Spring Supplemental Ordinance. Um, uh, Mr. Hayes. Hello, Mayor and uh, members of City Council. Uh, what you have in front of you, starting on page 105, is the uh, 2022 Spring Supplemental. As a little bit of backup, uh, there's three chances to to adjust the budget. The biggest one, of course, is actually building the budget in the August September uh, time frame. And then on top of that, we have two uh, bites at the apple. We'll have a fall supplemental and a spring supplemental. Uh, fall supplementals smaller, usually more more technical. Uh, the spring supplemental that you have in front of you is is larger. Uh, one of the main reasons it's larger is that it looks both backwards, looking back at 2021 and items that uh, that that needed some budget, and looking forward into 2022 as well. I'm going to point out a couple of, uh, of significant supplementals that are in here in 2021. You're going to find uh, $265 million for the issuance of first lien water refunding revenue bonds. You're going to find $28.3 million for land and water right acquisitions in the water fund. And then another $14.1 million. It's a transfer from the general fund over the capital projects fund because we got more, uh, more capital related revenue in than what was projected. Uh, in 2022, you will see 9.5 FTE across uh, various departments. Uh, you'll also see the appropriation of $30 million of, of both state and federal money associated with the I-70 Piccadilly project, and $13.1 million of, to pay off the Hogan Parkway debt, which freed up $2.4 million that we put toward transportation maintenance. Uh, lastly, this item uh, went to m &F and was unanimously approved to come forward to council today. So I have brought with me a cast of thousands uh, to uh, answer any questions that you all might have on any specific item. Questions uh, concerning the supplemental? I have a question, Mayor. Uh, listen, I'm having Mayor for Tim. Uh, yes, um, you, did you say 30 million on the I-70 Piccadilly? Yes, it was 25 so we did million not... of federal dollars and 5 million of, uh, of state. Say that again. Uh, it was 25 million um, for the better utilizing infrastructure to leverage the build multimodal and $5 million faster grant. Faster grant. Okay. So I thought, why did I think it was 16 million in my head? Was that? That was originally going to be our match. Okay. But now it's 25. Uh, no, the 25 is actually other people's money coming in. Uh, it's it's more technical. Remember, if we get a grant in, we still have to ask you to uh, to spend that grant. Okay. And so those are the those are the external dollars coming into external. the city. To build. Okay, and the sixteen we've already allocated or whatever it was. Okay, yeah. thank you. All right, you're welcome. Uh, Greg, um, how do we handle the uh, additional appropriations necessary uh, for the uh, alternate shelter options under the camping ban? And you're you're talking about the the ARPA the 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 recent ARPA decisions. We're we're still for the, looking for the temporary, ones. not for the permanent, but for the temporary. Yep. Um, for for any of the decisions that you made based on on ARPA dollars earlier in the year, they'll be coming back to you in the fall supplemental. We're still working on it, and you can we 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 can and do often do budget. Uh, we'll do the work first, and then ask for budget later. I think he's referring the mayor's referring to the short term shelter that are being will be more of a general fund conversation that we're going to have in May. Is that correct, mayor? Um, the short no, term, I'm, the, I'm referring the, short term the short term would be the, um, the that which has already been approved, which would be the uh, day resource center improvements. Right, we, that'll be a, a conversation on May 2nd, where we will bring those figures once we have those numbers for the repurposing of the day resource center. Okay. And at that point, we will give Greg direction on how to find that budget, but that's not our, but that will likely be okay. general consideration. Thank you. Uh, further questions. I uh, say none. Is there any objection to moving 5C forward? Uh, seeing none, uh, 5C will move. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, 6A, is there any objection to moving 6A forward? Um, well, this is just, is this for information only or is it just require action? Uh, we, we do have to bring it forward to, uh, to. Very well. Is there objection to moving 6A forward? 
Seeing none, 6A will move forward. Thank you. Um, not a 9A ARPA funded restaurant assistance program. Um, Council Member Jurinski. Yes, thank you. So uh, this is the uh, restaurant program that we had originally allocated $2 million of ARPA funds um, in the January winter workshop. And I really went back and forth with this one, um, struggled with this one. This program, you know, as we know, started as a pilot program pre-COVID and pre-restaurant shutdowns um, in Northwest Aurora. And, um, you know, those businesses and those restaurants are, are just fantastic. But now we've been through COVID and now we've been through a pandemic and, and business shutdowns and COVID the, the pandemic woman. I'm sorry, what? Please proceed. Um so so um now we've seen you know all these restaurant shutdowns and, and the way that this was originally described was um that this funding would be for kitchen build outs. I'd come to find out um, that that's not entirely true. Um, a business that we've we've all, I think, heard about cerebral brewing um, has asked to be a part of this program, and they, of course, have no kitchen. Um, so I found that out. And then I also found out that another applicant, um, full battle rattle deli has applied to be a part of this program and the space that they found um, that would work for them has a kitchen already. Um, it just needs to be refurbished. So when I found out about this and that the way that the program was originally explained to us maybe wasn't, you know, entirely true that there, you know, it does help with um, other startups and business. I think my thought is just now going through this and personally experiencing the restaurant shutdowns um, and seeing how many vacant kitchens there are all across this city in every single ward. Um, I like the idea of keeping the $2 million um, in place in this program, but eliminating um, new kitchen build outs. I think a lot of that, um, you know, can be negotiated in TMI and, and build outs with landlords. Um, but I definitely, if there's kitchens that we can get back open, some of these vacancies, um, these restaurants that went down, these bars that went down, if we can get tenants in there, if we can get them back open and maybe refurbish some of the vacant kitchens we have, I have no problem with that. I just really, um, since day one, have had a problem with using this grant funding for brand new kitchen build outs since going through, um, you know, these shutdowns and seeing how many uh, vacant kitchens there are throughout the city now. Further discussion? Here. Mayor Pertim. Did I just hear that two have applied? I thought this wasn't even a program yet. To have applied um, because we had approved it in the in the winter workshop, and so when I had spoken with Andrea, uh, two had applied, and when I was given um, you know two weeks, and I think it's turned into a lot more than two weeks to um, figure out how to reconfigure this program, I had told Andrea. You know, I don't, once I found out also that Cerebral Brewing was one of the, the applicants, and I was pretty blown away by that because obviously that they're not building any type of a kitchen. That's not what they're asking for their help for. I was like, well, how? That's not how this program was explained to us. So I didn't want to, you know, further hold anything up. So I told Andrea, I had said, um, you know, for now, I guess to keep keep talking to the two that had apply until until we we decide, I guess tonight, whether we're gonna move this forward or not. But my concern is how did that was that an RFP? I, I guess I'm lost as to who got to apply for it. Because if two have already, but how did it get out to anybody else in the whole city? Andrew, do you want to speak on that? 
Oh, I think you're muted. I'm, I'm here. Sorry. Sorry, council member. Um, sure, I'll speak to that. So this program, as, as you indicated, had been a pilot and there have been people kind of lining up. Our idea is to, um, you know, with your guidance, work with folks. You actually sent uh, the second applicant to us before trying to reconsider the program. And so we've talked to these folks. Each application will be individually approved by the council based on a review of how much money they need and our attempts to um, reach out across the city to, in this case, as as you want to adjust it, work with folks to adjust existing vacant kitchens and other, you know, obsolete buildings. So, that... so my concern is if there's only two million and two have already applied, um, I, I don't think this is equitable across the city. How how much is a kitchen typically, or how much are we allotting? So each each project, I. Each project in the past, we've done somewhere between two and three hundred thousand. We had one kitchen that we did where or worked on, by the way, which was a rehab of an existing um, bar to rehab their kitchen. It was just fixing certain things in that and bringing it up to speed. So okay. that's so, something we've done. So it's two to 300,000. We right. believe we can get one kitchen per ward, you know, one fix. Right. So well, that's my concern. So because if you do, I mean, if it's 200, you've got 10 um, to give out if, or if it's 300, that's gonna reduce the 10 to whatever. Um, so I just want to make sure that every ward has an opportunity to have someone apply for it. And and based on this council's desire to make this a citywide program, our goal would be to specifically work with, we have to identify landlords that are willing to participate. And so we're actually going to be seeking out people to participate in this program. And then could you address council member Jurinsky's um, point? Because she said there's already vacant um, kitchens all over the city. So why would we want to bring more kitchens in if we, if they're, they're underutilized currently? Well, council, council member Bergen, council member Bergen, that's, I, that's, this is what I'm bringing back is that um, I actually, that's the piece I want to eliminate. Um, right. There's so many vacant kitchens. So I'm asking to move this forward um, and and not um, include new infrastructure for kitchens. And to your point also, if we're not putting in hoods, grease traps, all these types of things, those real expenses, I think it will be much more equitable because it, it, there should be more funding. If we're just, if we're rehabbing kitchens, stuff like that, I don't think we're at that 300,000 maybe not even that $200,000 mark. I mean, I don't know, but we will get to individually approve each one that comes forward. And so by taking that piece out of building brand new kitchens and putting in all that brand new in infrastructure and getting some of these places that went down, um, getting them back open, it's not gonna be as big of an expense. Okay, so one more question, uh, please. please. Uh, Andrea? If so, if we eliminate the the new kitchens because there's existing uh, restaurants that that closed down, and and obviously landlords would like to have tenants, so I'm thinking right now of one in Southlands that is vacant. Um, would there? How would an incentive or a grant work for them? Would it Would it be for the landlord to help bring a tenant in? Or so, the tenant, so tenant gets the incentive. That, I guess I'm, I'm really confused as to what, how we're giving money out. So if, if we eliminate the, the new kitchens. Right. So if a brand new kitchen would mean that we were looking at a space that was formerly a retail space. Um, no, no, I get that. I'm talking about if we eliminate what yeah. Councilmember Jarinski wants to do. 
how would this look? So now we would be focusing on places that have some infrastructure, but might not be appropriate for certain tenants. So for example, in the case of the Battle Rattle Deli, um, the spot that they're looking to do is on the campus and it does not have a full kitchen. It does not have a hood, it does not have. And so we would explore how much infrastructure we could move or or add to to make the space workable for this particular tenant. So you have to have a space. And a lot of times what's happening with the landlord, if there is a vacant kitchen, someone comes in and there are examples of this all over the city. This is how it could work. Our staff will obviously you know, ferret out each one individually. But we would take an individual space that and a tenant, and we're vetting the tenant. We're finding out, is the space appropriate for them? What does it need to activate that space again with a new tenant? And sometimes the landlord doesn't want to make those improvements because they've already got an improved restaurant. So this allows us to assist both parties to activate that space again by providing some of the uh, capital needed to adjust a space for a tenant that both might have. And it encourages perhaps a landlord who would previously only look at credit tenants to look at smaller businesses that might not have the capital they would need to update the space to the things that would make it usable for them. Okay, but if they don't need to update it, is there any opportunity for a vacant restaurant to, I'm trying to envision how, if if they have a kitchen, it's it's vacant, how do we help them bring somebody in? I, I guess I'm not understanding. So the we could, in this case, and I have not, you know, had discussions with council member, Jarinsky on all the specific details, but what we could do is we could spend some of that money and perhaps guarantee a tenant that might not be a credit tenant so that the landlord would allow that person to go in and utilize the space as is. Okay. Yeah, Council Member Bergen, if I could just jump in, I think in that situation, what Andrea had mentioned before is First, we have to identify landlords that want to be a part of that program. So the, the landlord that you have in mind over at Southlands, I would say, you know, if we move this forward, have them reach out to Andrea. And essentially, my thought is, you know, that that property um, would be identified in this program as, you know, some money available. Um you know, and and maybe for startup costs. I mean, that's what I'm saying. We keep talking about kitchens, but when I found out that Cerebral Brewery, that this is the program that their money was coming from, you know, that's a brewery. They're not they're not building a kitchen. You know, so I think there's certainly some different types of uses. I think what I'm trying to move forward is just taking out building brand new kitchen infrastructure. But like Andrea said, as soon as we can identify landlords who who want to be a part of this program, we can certainly. Um, we have a number of restaurant uh, folks that are working with our small business development center. Um, we know that they could, that they have capital available, that they could make a go of it. They're just looking for the right space, but they might not have the credit backing uh, you know, and so we might be able to do different things. The overall goal of the program was to fill vacant underutilized space. And if that meant building new kitchens, then that was something we were willing to try. And we've done some of that in this in the program so far. Um, uh, but, Additionally, so so like Bubba and Pops and the bakery were what had one kitchen, it didn't have two, and we did both spaces. So we split that between the two. So there are a lot of ways that we can assist 
small businesses in the restaurant industry to achieve their dream and create a destination in a vacant, underutilized building. And we would work with you. And as I said, each each um, property that we were incentivizing, we would bring back to the council and the city council could decide if that was a good use of the money and it would allow us to you know, pick and choose among the wards about where we spend money and how we how we do that in assisting. Because I I will say that working in Ward One with spaces that are old and really really tired is different than working in Ward Six where the spaces are newer and perhaps they just need maybe bringing in new tenants with some rental guarantees would would be sufficient. And one of my thoughts too is um, maybe this is the pot of money that we could pull from to fix the storefront uh, of the vacant restaurant space attached to the people's building and focus on getting a tenant in that restaurant space. Is there is there a clarity on the Durant Street proposal? Mayor. Councilmember Thank you, sir. Uh, so I just want to make sure I'm fully understanding um, where we're kind of going with this. So it sounds to me like this is kind of meant to be used to improve existing restaurant spaces that are vacant uh, and would help would be restaurateurs kind of get their business uh, up and running because they either lack access to the credit needed to get a loan um, or just otherwise don't have access to large amounts of capital. So is that kind of like a fair summary of what we've discussed so far? Yes, I, and I believe that yes, that would be it. That each tenant might have different needs, and we could explore that individually on a one, case by case basis. Okay, um, so that sounds like a great idea um, to me. Uh, I would, however, like to see something in the backup since we're just kind of discussing uh, what I think is a good idea. I'd like something a little more concrete. Uh, with some of those details kind of uh, filled in. And um, if I under, if I heard you correctly, Andrea, you said that the goal would be to bring each of these to council. Um, is that right? Uh, yes, and and um, you may not recall, I don't I don't know that you were on council at the time that we did the other three, uh, other four, but each one of those is an, is an incentive agreement on its own. And so the council that we bring that to study session, discuss it, talk about the pros and the cons, and that would give us the opportunity to hone the project or adjust the incentive agreement to meet the council's desires. Okay. Um, that's a little different than the other incentive or not incentives, but like relief packages that we've put together. Um, you know, staff, basically we approved the funding, but staff administered everything. Um, and I don't think we ever had to come back and reapprove uh, specific projects. The reason I bring that up is because that kind of feels inappropriate to me, uh, where we would effectively be picking directly the folks who are going to benefit from the funding that we're uh, appropriating. And that's not something that we, at least on my time on council, that we have done. Um, so is there a way that we can separate council from that decision making process? Like I'm, I'm fine with, you know, once we have. Um, back up and you know we're all in agreement that this is the design of the program i'm fine with appropriating the funds i just don't know if it's appropriate for us to you know micromanage each applicant to that extent it's, that just seems strange it's, it's very similar council member it's very very similar to what you already do on redevelopment projects through aura and the board where we bring each deal to you or you individually discuss that deal in an executive session to give staff uh, up thumbs up or thumbs down about whether it's worthy to come forward to the group. Okay. Thanks. This is a relatively small amount of money to a redevelopment uh, project. And so what I'd like to see is in, in a couple of weeks that this comes back uh, kind of fleshed out in writing uh, the, the modifications uh, for what Council Member Jorinsky is saying, and I, I agree with Council Member McConnell, that when we're dealing with smaller, very specific projects like that, we, we really should have the criteria uh, defined in writing, but, but uh, let staff make the decision within the criteria. Is there further discussion? Mayor. Uh, Mayor Pertum. 
Yeah, I'm fine with staff making the decisions as long as it's equitable across the city and all wards. Okay, um, further discussion. Mayor. Councilmember Coons. So I'm just concerned about, it sounds like what we're saying is there will be no new kitchens, period, is the proposal. And so I know that there are folks that have been working with the city in relation to this program, but don't currently have kitchens build, built out, but are trying to get kitchens built out. So are those previously, um, those tenants that have previously been working with the city now not going to be able to pursue what they thought they were gonna be able to pursue and have been talking to other funders about getting support for. So it's my understanding that there's only two applicants so far and neither one um, is for a brand new kitchen build out. Um, for the previous um, pilot program, I think there are folks that, um, I think the El Alba folks, so that's what I'm concerned about is they've been working with the city and now the terms are being changed on them. I was told there was only these two. Andrea, can you speak to that? So El Alba had been in, El Alba had been in queue, if you will, um, to help with the assistance, um, not approving new kitchens in this program may not, um, may not prevent us from doing that or the other thing that we could work on um, with them is they were currently trying to fundraise because remember um, this program has always been a third owner, a third tenant, and a third um, the city participating. So kind of equal payments. And so before we before we authorize work on anything, everybody has to have their financing in place. And that's true for all applicants, not just um, not just people that we've been talking to in queue. Well, we're all over the map right now. I, I, I thought we would have a very specific proposal in front of us, but we do not. And so, um, uh, um, My specific yeah. proposal was yeah. to keep this the way that it was, but just eliminate new kitchen build outs. Like that is my specific proposal. That's it. Very well. Um, uh, 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 is there objection to the Jarensky proposal? Councilmember Coombs. Further objection? Mayor. All right, Councilmember McConnell. So I, I like where the discussion is going, but I'm concerned that we're going to be prohibiting folks who've already been working with the city, um, which by the way, our previous kitchen programs, is my understanding, they've all been very successful. Um, and this is a departure. Uh, in some ways from that, I'm, I'm honestly really torn. Um, I would have preferred to have just left the proposal alone the way it was when we approved it in the winter workshop. Um, I don't want to exclude folks that we're already working with. That's not an angle I have considered. Further opposition. Uh, Mayor, I'm kind of in the same boat as that in just the sense that uh, I've been working with the El Alba group as well and, and that kitchen in Northwest Aurora. And I know that community pretty well having worked there for 15 years. And so, yeah, I'm kind of the same way. I, you know, I don't mind having other groups get it, but it's just, I just don't want it to hinder that project. Further opposition. So I have uh, Council Member Coombs, Council Member McConnell, Council Member Medina in opposition. There's a further opposition. Uh, seeing no uh, further opposition, uh, item number um, 9A will move forward. And I think that, let me see, so that's uh, Jarinski, 
proposal and uh, um, I think so uh, let me put a second question forward because that was a issue that council member McConnell raised about whether or not um, the council will make the, the individual decisions will come back to council council member McConnell yes sir um, I would like to see uh, whatever finally appears in our backup uh, for this, because I'm assuming this is going to have to come through uh, for a formal vote, um, have that process where we're removed from the final decisions, basically. Uh, I understand your perspective, um, Andrea. I feel like this is um, a different animal from a large, you know, redevelopment project that we execute through our uh, urban renewal authority. These are much more granular kinds of decisions that I don't think it's appropriate for council to micromanage. Uh, further discussion on the Marcano proposal. Is there objection to the Marcano proposal? Then, um, Mayor, Mayor, uh, Mayor Patel. Sorry, I'm not objecting. Um, I'm fine with staff making the decisions again, as long as it's, you know, not just going to one place, all the money, two million. <laughs> <laughs> further discussion on the Marcano yeah, proposal. So loud and clear. <laughs> further discussion on the Marcano proposal. Is there objection to the McConnell proposal? Uh, seeing none, then um, uh, item number uh, 6A, I'm sorry, item number 9A will move forward as modified by Council Member Jurinsky and Council Member McConnell. Item 9B, rules of order and procedure amendment expenses. Um, staff, who's uh, going to be presenting on that? Wayne Summer? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor and Council. Uh, this resolution includes recommended changes to the Council rules of order and procedures provided as an offshoot from our recent audit of Mayor and City Council expenses. Uh, as background, this recurring audit engagement was requested by the MNF Committee, and we presented the results of the first report at the March 7th, 2022 study session. Council Member Gardner recommended that these proposed changes that were drafted by internal audit come back to City Council in this resolution. The rationale for these proposed changes is first of all, to clean up the language in the procedures for any outdated items, any items that lack clarity and any missing references. And then second, the proposed changes are to improve efficiency in both the reporting and recording of City Council expenses. Uh, I can go through the various changes if you'd like to do that. Uh, if not, I can just take questions. Uh, questions of the staff? Mayor. Uh, question. Uh, Councilmember McConnell. Oh. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, yes, uh, so I guess my first question is uh, item 13, um, local business expenses. Uh, if Am I reading this correctly? Does this mean that now if we go to a a uh, local coffee shop, for example, to meet with a constituent, we would be able to utilize our per diem to cover the cost of, you know, my beverage, for example, um, whereas before we could not do that. Is that correct? Uh, yes, uh, that is correct. Okay. Um, and the, I guess I, I, this is more of like a more general request um, since being on council, I have only ever just used the P card and then provided receipts for expenses. So, um, could we get like a little crash course on how per diems work, I guess, um, for interested council members? We could certainly do that. All right. Thank you. So, uh, uh, Mayor Pertem. Yeah, I, unless I'm missing something, I don't remember this going to the rules committee. Uh, staff, um, we drafted the proposed language, forwarded it to uh, Councilmember Gardner as chair of MNF, and this was his recommendation as to how to move forward. But it's a rules change. Not, yes. I mean, I'm, I'm fine not. with the changes. It's just procedurally, it should have gone to the rules committee. I'm not familiar with that process, so I'll. Okay. Hans. <laughs> from the city attorney's office, may I? Please. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, I think that the issue with this particular one is 
it has to deal with financial issues and money, and that's why we handle here on the NDMNF. So, no, uh, it's a rules change. It's a rules change. I, I I agree with that. I'm not opposing that. I'm just explaining to you that it, it had to do with finance and issues uh, that were seen on the MNF committee. Is it uh, normally a dual? Is it would it be dual assigned then to MNF and to rules? No, Mayor, actually, the rules actually indicate that issues are supposed to only go to one committee. That this is an unusual circumstance that that. The rules were uh, changes to the rules were recommended by MNF rather than through the ad hoc rules committee. Okay. Further discussion on item nine C. Mayor. Uh, May, uh, Councilmember McConnell. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, I have another question on section A travel. Um, it, the change, I guess, was upgrades within economy class are allowed. Um, what does that mean? Uh, Nowadays, a number of airlines have uh, several kinds of classes within economy. United is one, for instance. Um, and there was no language that dealt with upgrades within economy. Only language dealt with upgrades from economy to a higher level class. Uh, what we're recommending is that uh, you allow upgrades within economy, um, but still require approval for upgrades from economy to higher level classes. Okay, thank you. I, I guess this is an issue because I just fly Southwest for the most part, so. <laughs> Further discussion? Uh, seeing none, is there opposition to moving 9C forward? Uh, seeing none, opposition 9C uh, will move forward. Thank you. Uh, item number 9D. Uh, rules of order and procedure uh, amendment, uh, public comment, proclamations, uh, committee subjects, and other matters. Um, Mayor, we skipped 9C. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, number 9C, rules of order and procedure amendment, uh, preferential treatment. Um, Mr. Schulte. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. This was a uh, request out of the Rules Policy Committee to amend the rules to allow uh, certain uh, items or benefits to be able uh, to be provided by to council members or or by uh, citizens. And so it amends section 1-43 of the Aurora City Code to be consistent, I'm sorry, it amends council rules to be compliant with section 1-43 of the Aurora City Code, which is titled as gift to elected officials uh, to allow uh, areas of three additional areas where uh, to avoid an appearance of preferential treatment or benefits. Um, that's, you know, the, the, it's in your backup, but generally um, goods or services offered to the general public and not just elected officials are okay. Uh, the value of the goods and services provided should generally be less than $100 per occurrence and not exceed $300 per year from the same person and organization. That is again from the, uh, from the city code at $300 per year. The second item that was added was acceptance of items such as food or beverages. So somebody takes a council member out to dinner, um, the person can pay for it um, as long as it's generally less than $100 per occurrence and then not to exceed uh, $300 per year from the same person uh, and or organization. And finally, uh, elected officials can receive complimentary gifts um, that, are, that are also provided or could be provided to other organizations such as calendars, appointment books, pens, t-shirts, and so forth, but not including cash or gift cards, because as council knows, cash and gift cards uh, are the equivalent of cash. We're trying to stay away from any issues uh, that could come up in that regard. So um, the, the, the bolded items in the resolution, what was added to the to section uh, K of Appendix G that was already in the rules. And again, nothing in the section is intended to, to conflict with section 1-43 of the city code. That's all I have. I have questions. Questions on 9C? I say none. Is there any? Um, I'm sorry. Mayor Marconi. Thank you, Councilor Marconi. Thank you, sir. Um, so this one really gave me a lot of heartburn, um, especially seeing as we just discussed, um, you know, changes to per diem, um, where if someone wants to meet up with us for dinner to discuss something, 
pertaining to city business, we can now cover our, for ourselves up to the per diem limit if I'm uh, understanding that previous change um, correctly. So um, this still just seems really improper uh, to me. Um, frankly, I'd like to see us copy, if we're gonna copy you know, standards for uh, what gifts elected officials can receive, I think we're already way too permissive in the city of Aurora. Um, I know that congressional staff, for example, can't even accept a hot dog. Um, so allowing people to buy us, you know, up to $100 meals and capping that at $300 a year, which is now a whole accounting, um, you know, um, burden that needs to occur. This just seems like it's unnecessary um, and really is flirting with the appearance of impropriety. It doesn't sit well with me and I will strongly uh, recommend my colleagues do not support this either. Further discussion? Uh, is, there, is there objection to oh, moving on to uh, Mayor Putem? I don't even remember this one. Um, okay, so if it's if it's a meal, doesn't that, do you just turn in your receipt and get reimbursed? It's not out of travel, correct? So this would allow, Mayor Pro Tem, this would allow in those situations where, I, and, and Councilmember Marcano, I think the intent, just going back to the Rules Committee when we when it was discussed, this is one of those situations where you're an elected official, but you're not going to dinner with, with a developer or somebody that's trying to solicit uh, your vote. It would be if you're out with friends or so forth and somebody wants to pick up the bill, that you wouldn't be prohibited from doing so. Now, obviously, you would have to in your own uh, you know, your own discretion about whether or not you receive that or you, you allow that person to, to purchase your dinner. Uh, but this just gives a way that it, if, it, if it meets your ethical discretion uh, that you could do it and not violate council rules. That was what I remember coming out of the oh, rules committee. Okay. It's, yeah, it's coming back to me. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Further discussion on 9C? Mayor. Mayor uh, Councilmember Ricardo. Thank you, sir. Uh, and thank you for that explanation. I unfortunately was double booked for this meeting, so I didn't have a chance to be there for the discussion. But it was my understanding that we could already freely associate with friends. Um, if they happen to be colleagues, that's good for us. But, you know, folks in our own personal time uh, and not have to have a rule that allows us uh, to do so. Um, so it just, could you explain us to why this is legally necessary, I guess, uh, and, you know, is what I'm asking here. Sure. Uh, so before, yes, in your, your family, your close friends that you were very friendly with before you were elected, that's different. But I think as you probably have all experienced as you became elected officials, your friend group has grassly grown. Um, and there are some people out there that might have ulterior motives. It just allowed you to make that ethical discretion decision that if it wasn't somebody that you would hang out with that was your best friend or a family member that went out to dinner and they weren't and you weren't talking about city business. I mean, you could be under this rule, but if you weren't and you and they picked up dinner, you would be in violation of the current rule as it as it stands. No further uh, questions, discussion. Is there opposition to moving 9C forward? Yeah, Mayor, sorry, I did have just another follow-up question. Please proceed. Yeah, I, I guess I'm just really struggling understanding the, where, where's that point then, where someone is like a friend or an acquaintance versus someone who has an ulterior motive. That that seems like something that you can't really measure uh, or uh, <laughs> prove. Um, so I just don't see why this is, necessary because I feel like it's opening up now a acceptable level of ulterior motive as it were as opposed to before it was prohibited um, and you know there, but there's still nothing that would stop us from you know when my mom's in town buying me dinner or you know some of my good friends who live across town buying me dinner or whatever the case may be so it just seems very strange and unnecessary to me still. And just to follow up, the litmus test would be preferential treatment, right? If you if if the person or the council member was expecting preferential treatment because of that situation, it would be a violation of the rule. So that would kind of be if you're out to dinner with somebody, all of a sudden say, hey, and by the way, council member, you you know you, I've, I've got this you know this, this issue coming up for council, then you would say, you know what, I, I appreciate your offer to buy me dinner, but I'm not going to accept that. But the, the goal was to match it with, and again, the rules committee gave. Obviously, I don't have a position on this, obviously, but the rules committee right. gave 
the discretion was let's match it with city code and that's where that numbers come from and so i think and again not speaking for the rules committee but you know the, the, the low number or the low dollar amount was to prevent anybody being bribed for a hundred dollar dinner i think that was kind of the the issue so uh, just to kind of give you some feedback for the rules committee okay thank you further discussion uh is there objection to moving 9c forward mayor i object I'm sorry. okay uh further objection coombs. uh coombs further objection with you further objection uh, i don't nine c we'll move forward Item 9D, Rules of Order and Procedure, Amendment and Public Comment and Proclamations, Committee Subjects and Other Matters. Um, Mr. Bossman. Uh, yes, Your Honor. This matter was, a, was originally discussed in the 2021 Ad Hoc Rules Committee. It wasn't brought forward at that time. Uh, it, it moved on to the 2022 Ad Hoc Rules Committee. Th this is just a basic cleanup of provisions throughout the rules they're they're very they they reflect our current practices uh throughout such as speakers have to you know, give their first and last name what city they live in and contact information to the clerk that's been going on there's a definition of proclamations which there there was previously an issue between when is it an item a, a proclamation versus when is it a resolution uh conflicts uh the the rules were very very similar to what the code uh indicated but since there were some minor discrepancies that was simply cleaned up and it references uh, the city code rather than keeping it in the rules um, then there are a variety of uh, board and commission, well, committee committee changes that reflect what the current practices are of the council committees. Uh, questions or discussion on, on uh, number 90? Mayor. Uh, council member Coombs. Um, so, uh, City Attorney Bratzman, what I'm wondering is where it's saying that people need to give their first and last name and city, that's only to the clerk. They don't have to say their last name publicly if they choose not to um, when they're giving their comment. Yes, and, and there's a safety there's a safety issue both directions and what the committee had discussed was having the first and last name given to the clerk, but not not addressed publicly. Thank you. Further discussion? Mayor. Councilman McConnell. Thank you, sir. Um, I just wanted to point out uh, section three, the second paragraph, uh, or I guess that's the third paragraph. Um, the housing community is missing services um, in the, for that second restatement of the name. Um, so just a typo. Further discussion? Mayor. That reminded me of one other thing. Can we, I see that we changed the name of one committee um, in the rules committee, but there's been pretty extensive uh, conversation for over a year now, I think, about changing the name of the public relations, communications, libraries, tourism boards, committees, and citizen groups, um, because that's a really long name to say. Um, and we've had several suggestions. I even just messed up the order because I'm tired, um, but it's a long name to say. And so I have been hoping for some time that we could get around to changing that name to something a little more manageable. May Mayor? Uh, Mayor Patim. Just to address that. Um, so these were left over from last year's Rules Committee where we made some of the minor changes. And what you're referring to, I think, does need to be changed. And we can certainly address that at the next Rules Committee and bring it forward. Thank you. Uh, further discussion? Uh, seeing none, is there opposition uh, to moving um, item number 9D forward? Uh, seeing no opposition, item number 9D will for, for move forward. Item number 9E, Rules of Order and Procedure Amendment, a censure procedure. Um, Mr. 
uh, Jack, uh, how do you say it? Uh, Bajorek, how do you say it? Thank you, uh, Mayor uh, Jack Bajorek, Deputy City. Bajorek, okay, very good. Right. Thank you. Please proceed. So, so as a reminder, this item started uh, at your request in a previous study session uh, you, 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 with the idea of simplifying the, uh, the censure process going forward. Uh, presented at that study session were uh, several examples of various jurisdictions' uh, uh, censure process. Uh, uh, and as a reminder, um, uh, an additional reminder, uh, most of the uh, jurisdictions in Colorado don't have a specific process. It just follows the standard resolution process that each jurisdiction uses. Uh, the item was sent back to the Rules Committee for further consideration and, and to come up with a, a, a more definitive proposal coming forward. Uh, what you have before you is a, is a, the results of that visit to the Rules Committee and the direction from the Rules Committee. Um, it, it follows to some degree uh, Denver's process with some changes because uh, Denver with the strong mayor um, uh, form of government has a little different uh, council interaction. Uh, but uh, fundamentally, this is uh, how this uh, process lays out at the direction of the Rules Committee is that uh, uh, an individual council member can bring in a, a motion uh, uh, in the form of a resolution to uh, censure uh, the conduct of another council member. Uh, there's a requirement to provide notice to all of council and the subject council member uh, specifying exactly what the violation is, is um, alleged to be. Uh, the item is brought forward by that the uh, the uh, council member pursuant to their uh, prerogative under rule of uh, 3b of the the council rules uh, it requires a super majority for passage of a central resol resolution and uh, probably the most important part based on the interaction we had with the uh, council and you also mayor is it eliminates a lot of the attorney work uh, you get rid of a lot of the inter attorney involvement. The only involvement for, will be from the city uh, attorney who can answer questions of law and process and will assist the, uh, the uh, council member bringing the resolution in drafting that resolution. No, uh, so with that, if you have any questions. Thank you. Questions of staff? Mayor. Hi, uh, Councilor McConnell. Thank you, sir. Um, I do appreciate the um, work that went into this. I think making it a more transparent and simpler process um, is great. I am uh, still curious, why is council still judge, jury, and executioner here? Um, I'd much rather see that be um, an independent board, just because I've seen how partisan politics can play into this, and I don't want to uh, potentially create a weapon um, for folks to abuse. Mayor. Uh, Mayor Pintum. Um, I think the two thirds was the, um, you know, kind of the mechanism to make sure that people don't abuse it. Um, it's not, it's not, you know, six majority, it's two thirds. Um, and we were just trying to simplify the process and then take out the attorneys and the cost um, related to that. And then it, as um, uh, Jack Bajoric said, just to mirror some of the, the other jurisdictions and in, in how they do it. Sure. And I think, and, I, and if you look at Commerce City, they censured the mayor, and it really wasn't on the violation of any rule. It was based on uh, his his behavior in terms of managing the staff, working with staff and council. Further discussion? Mayor. Councilmember Coombs. Um, I mean, we do have actual rules about work with colleagues, with how we conduct ourselves with colleagues and staff. So I think in our case, um, actual violation of rules would fall under what you just described. No. Um, but I guess my concern, sorry, I just got a little thrown off by being interrupted. Um, <laughs> my concern is still that it's us, the council, making that decision. So I do wonder if there's a way for a third party, you know, for a community a board of uh, citizens or some other entity that isn't council to be making a judgment that's really based on were the rules broken or not. 
Um, I don't think it should be, um, do I think it was okay for you to break the rules? It's were they broken or not? Um, and I think that this opens us up to just as long as we feel like someone broke the rules in a way that we're okay with, then we're not gonna censure them, even though the rules were still broken. Mayor? Further discussion. Oh, Mayor, just to address. Uh, Mayor for Tim. Um, so the city attorney, it's still in there that the city attorney should answer, well, shall answer questions of law and process. So I, I would think, and maybe this was the intent, would be that if the attorney would be able to give advice as to whether it was a violation or not. I don't know if that helps. Um, I'm sorry, who? Um, Coombs. Councilmember Coombs. Doesn't it specifically say that they can't advocate for a censure or against the censure? So wouldn't that preclude them from taking any position on whether or not a rule was violated? So, so a question, yeah, I of, if I may, Mayor. Please. So, so that, 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 that's legal jargon. Uh, uh, what you're talking about is a question of fact, not a question of law. Uh, the, 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 the council, it would be up to the council to decide whether or not the facts fit and it was in fact a violation. That's, that, that lies with council. The, a question of law presented to uh, the city attorney, let's, let's give an example, is, is uh, Mr. City Attorney, I, I, I said X and Y, it, wouldn't that be protected under the First Amendment and not in fact a violation of the, of the uh, city code or whatever? Uh, so that's more of a question of law. And then the city attorney would go through the analysis of whether or not that's protected speech or not protected yeah. speech based on the uh, ba based on the environment and the scenario. Uh, but that's different than the question of fact of whether or not the, the actual words violated the code. Yeah, and ultimately, it's the voters that will make the decision. Yeah, Mayor Zavonik. Councilmember Zavonik. Yeah, that, the, so that was exactly the point I was going to make to Councilmember Coombs' comment is that by having this conversation in public, a couple of things. One, we have to have two thirds of majority to either say no, they didn't or yes, they did. And we're having the conversation out in public. Um, and if, if our constituents determine that we are not actually applying the law fairly or applying the rules fairly, they're going to hear the conversation and the debate and we're able to ask questions of, of the city attorney. So I think this takes us out of the situation that we currently have, which turns into a little kangaroo court where we are incurring significant costs to the city and says, look, if you're going to bring forward a censure charge against one of your colleagues, you're going to have to make the case that they did, in fact, violate a rule. You're going to have to get the support of two thirds of council and do it in front of uh, you know, all of our residents. And if the majority of council determines that that's not the case and the residents disagree, well, th they'll have the ultimate say on this. Further discussion. Yes. Yes. Um, so the current rule does actually provide for a public hearing. We just didn't do that last time. Um, but there is supposed to be a public hearing on censure charges. So that's already in the rules for our constituents to have a hearing of the facts and our rationale around that. Um, but also, um, you know, I think not, not a lot of people sit and watch our meetings. So they're not necessarily going to sit and watch our conversation about censure to determine whether or not they think that we've actually um, conducted ourselves according to our rules and policies that we have in place. Um, and so that's where, again, I think that having someone other than council making this decision makes it more impartial and less likely to become still a kangaroo court. I think that saying that this prevents it from being that is inaccurate. Further discussion? Uh, is there opposition to moving uh, item number uh, 9E forward? Mayor. Coombs. Councilman Mercado. Mayor, um, I, I oppose it moving forward just because we're still judge, jury, executioner. I feel like that should be an independent body, but otherwise I like the changes. Councilman Coombs. Okay. Further uh, opposition? Medina. Medina. Further opposition? Uh, seeing no further opposition, item number uh, nine E will move forward. Item number nine, excuse me, nine F, uh, rules of order and procedure amendment, quasi judicial decisions, and ex parte communications. 
Um, uh, Mr. Barson. Yes, sir. This matter was discussed with the ad hoc committee. Um, one of the most difficult conversations that council members have with constituents is, is regard to quasi judicial matters. Uh, that when, when you're allowed to talk to your constituents and, and to people that are proposing, uh, in large part, developments or other planning issues that are quasi judicial, it's very, very difficult to try and tell your constituents that's great, please show up at the public hearing. I can't talk to you now. Having Being a council member and, and actually having to tell your constituents that you're not allowed to talk to them is a struggle. Um, so this, this rule, the, the simple addition is, this is a link to the city attorney's memo explaining why that's so, and, and, and it's just another avenue for council to point to and have a link in the council rules on quasi-judicial matters. Very well. Um, discussion, questions of staff? Uh, seeing uh, none, is there opposition to moving nine, item number 9F forward? Uh, seeing none, item number 9F will move forward. Um, uh, let's see. There no, seeing no further business before the council, uh, media is adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.